I'd like to call the meeting to order. We'd like a uh, city uh, city clerk, please take the roll. Councilmember Angler here. Councilmember Newman here. Councilmember Taylor here. Mayor Pro Tem Adam here. And Mayor McNamee here. All righty, we are going to be going into closed session. And with that, I'll turn it over to City Acting Assistant City Attorney, Patrick Meeker. Just want to make sure that there are no public comments for the closed session, correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have two closed session items tonight. The first one is a conference with legal counsel for existing litigation. The case is Caitlin Clint versus Fred Gessler and the City of Thousand Oaks. It's Ventura County Superior Court case number 5-6-2021. 551445, and this is pursuant to government code section 54956.9A. The second is also existing litigation. The case is David Hernandez versus City of Thousand Oaks. It's also Ventura County Superior <laughs> Court, case number 56 2021, 555370. Also pursuant to government code section 54956.9A. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We will go into, City Council will now go into closed session and we'll be back shortly. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Okay, we're back. Like to resume and turn the floor over to Assistant City Attorney Patrick E. Here, Patrick. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we had two closed sessions tonight, and there is nothing to report out for those two closed sessions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. With that, we'd like to uh, adjourn that portion of the meeting and uh, open the session at 6 p.m. Call to order. All rise, please. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Council Member Engler? Here. Council Member Newman? Here. Councilmember Taylor? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Here. And Mayor McNamee? Here. Let's move to uh, there are, our um, agenda items for uh, consent. Are there any items that uh, for public hearing that uh, would like to be pulled or any for continuance? None? Okay. Let's move forward. City Clerk, public comments. We have no public comments. Uh, really, this is this is unusual. Very good. City Manager, uh, let's move on to consent calendar. Any questions from Council? Any issues you want to pull and t discuss? Okay. This move the calendar. Rather, rather fast. Um, a motion? Move the calendar. Mo uh, Council Member Adam has moved the calendar. Madam Clerk? Council Member Angler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5 0. Excellent. Thank you. Let's move on to public hearings. City Clerk? Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 8A, prefabricated. Solar systems at various city facilities, CI 5562. Speakers are requested to state their name for the record. And it looks like we have one speaker. One speaker. And, and according to council standards, that speaker will have five minutes. Excellent. And I uh, just want to reiterate that you have three minutes. And I want to have five minutes. Maybe. Five minutes. Sorry. Thank you for the correction. And please direct all your comments towards the council as a whole. Please do not name any staff or council members directly presentation first thank you city managers keeping me on track thank you very much uh, dr cox you have a presentation sorry for the uh, 
uh, out of order sequence there. Thank you. It's okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm here this evening to present staff's recommendations for the construction of solar systems at various city facilities. Also here with me this evening are Mr. Ken Wang, Senior Analyst, and Nada Hadari, Deputy Public Works Director. The city prides itself on its commitment to the environment. To that end, Council established environmental sustainability as one of its top 10 priorities for this fiscal year. Included in its priority is, and I quote, make strategic sustainability investments, including clean energy and battery energy storage. This program exemplifies this commitment by developing on-site solar energy storage, sorry, on-site solar energy resources at all feasible city-owned facilities where solar is not already installed, and doing this strategically during a narrow window of opportunity. A 30% direct pay incentive became available January 1st to tax-exempt ent entities through the Federal Government's Inflation Reduction Act. But then coming soon on April the 15th, the utility will change the net energy metering, or NEM 2.0 tariff, which sets the reimbursement rate for generated solar energy. The new NEM 3 tariff will be much more unfavorable to the customer. This project has been prioritized and accelerated to meet this window of opportunity and thereby to take advantage of both of these considerable financial benefits. An RFP was developed and released last year in mid-December with a closing date of January 23rd. The city is utilizing a procurement method which allows for a single design bill contract for energy projects. Four proposals were received by the city, one of which was incomplete. A staff team evaluated and interviewed the other three proposers and pursued negotiations with two of these. The outcome is a recommendation to Council to award the agreement to Staten Solar Incorporated. Solar development is proposed for six sites as shown here. The Grant Brimhall Library and adjacent buildings at that complex, the Teen Center and the Adult Center. Also the Newbury Park Library, the city's golf course, Los Robles Greens, and our transportation center. The following slides show the proposed layout at those facilities designed to offset close to 100% of the facility's current energy use. The Grant Brimhall Library System is designed as a primarily rooftop system, but with carports added to the staff parking lot in an unshaded area where there will be no impact to trees. This system will become the city's second largest one after the one at Hill Canyon Treatment Plant, which is 584 kilowatts. With a desire to avoid placing carports in front of the adult center, the system designed for the Goebel Adult Center uh, utilizes part of the roof area of the main library to supplement what can be accommodated on the Goebel Center's roof. Again, this system is designed to avoid any shading issues and also eliminate the need for any tree removal. The teen center has the lowest energy consumption of the buildings in this complex and the solar system, the solar panels, can be accommodated entirely on the roof. A carport system will be utilized at the city's transportation center, providing shade to a double row of parking spaces. Although there is a desire to construct a larger system here, SCE's interconnection rules limit sizing to meet existing energy use. As the fleet of electric buses and electric vehicle charging expand, we anticipate adding to this system in the future. The city's golf course at Los Robles Greens has the second highest energy use after the main library, and consequently, the solar system there will be correspondingly sized. This system comprises three double wide carports and one cantilever single wide structure. Several trees will need to be removed at this site to accommodate the carports. And lastly, at Newbury Park Library, an entirely rooftop system will be placed on the roof of Newbury Park Library. This is uh, very convenient for access to the electrical room at that facility, which is on the second floor directly under that roof access panel. 
Here we present the cost before and after the anticipated federal incentive tax credit or ITC payment and the estimated payback time based on estimated production and energy use under the NEM 2.0 tariff. These are highly attractive payback times, which you'll see there in the last column. If for any reason the projects are not accepted by SCE under NEM 2.0, we anticipate needing to install batteries at these sites to mitigate the reduced energy generation credits uh, available under NEM 3.0. In that case, we would need to perform a revised cost-benefit analysis and bring that back to Council for your consideration. There is an existing CIP budget for this project. However, due to the accelerated timeline, we are requesting additional budget this year. The specific allocations are listed in the staff report. The first line of business is the interconnection application with SCE. Once approvals are received, the project would proceed with design and materials procurement. Due to high demand, the sooner that the developer can order the materials, the better. Even with long lead times, we expect the systems to be completed in approximately 18 months. That ends our presentation. I'm here with uh, Project Manager Ken Wang and uh, Public Works Deputy Director Nada Hodari, and we're available to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Cox. Again, yes, thank you for introducing uh, Senior Energy Analyst uh, Ken Wang and also our Public Works uh, Adrian Hodari. Thank you for being here. Council, do you have any questions of staff? Bob, Count, excuse me, Councilman Engler. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, thank you, Ms. Cox, for the um, great uh, presentation and for this project. Frankly, it's a great project to have in our town. A um, couple of quick questions. W one, you mentioned that at the uh, transportation center, we can't put a more robust system in because it's, uh, it's only conserved the current use there. Our, our, my question, I guess, are we able to put the infrastructure in for the future when we're going to have our, you know, when buses go electric and everything else have electric charging there? Right. The idea would be to size conduits appropriately so that the system could be expanded in the future without need for additional boring or trenching. Perfect. And then uh, over at the uh, golf course, uh, you mentioned there would be a couple of trees that need to uh, be culled out of that area. Um, what type of trees are they? Uh, oak trees? Are they uh, landscape trees? What, what are we talking about? There? No, there are no uh, protected trees there. They're unprotected. There are 12 trees that have to come out, unfortunately. They are tipu trees, which, as I said, are not protected trees. Thank you. Any other questions for Council? Councilman Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a very ambitious project at these six very prominent uh, sites in the city. I'm really uh, happy to see this come along. Um, it, did I, if I read this right, the uh, Federal Inflation Reduction Act is going to pay about 30 percent of the cost on this thing? Correct. So um, that ITC credit, which is 30 percent, has traditionally only been available to tax-paying entities, but under the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a new provision whereby tax-exempt entities can apply for the equivalent amount of funding under a direct pay method. Mm -hmm. The actual rules of exactly how that's going to happen have not been released yet. I think it's going to be run through the um, Internal Revenue Service, but we are awaiting direction on that. Mm -hmm. But we'll go after it. Certainly. Of course, yes. And just one other thing. Um, are we going to be a net exporter of energy after all these panels are in? Uh, no, the, the idea is to um, get close to meeting our current, ah, our current okay. demand. Because I know we are in Hill Canyon, right? We we create a little more than we actually need, don't we? Um, it it's varied. It it varies, yeah, from day to day. The idea is that over a year, you really are not permitted to size a system um, larger than the energy demand. SCE does not want to be paying generators under a net 
energy metering mm -hmm. arrangement. So over the course of a year, it's meant to balance out. Well, it's, it's enough if we can break even. Exactly. Good project, Dr. Cox. Thank you. Do you have other questions from council? I have a few. What direction are these uh, various solar panels directed in, as the compass? Oh, it, it uh, changes a little from one facility, from one site to another, but obviously they're going to be optimized as far as possible to point in a southerly or slightly southwesterly direction. Terrific. I think the uh, people who park there will appreciate the shading that they get from it so to protect their vehicles and the interiors. So this will be very, very nice. And I missed that in the presentation. What is our break-even point with what the city has to put out versus the energy savings? How many years are we looking at here? Well, given that the solar panels start falling off 20 years or so uh, with their efficiencies, what's, what's your projection on this? So uh, we ran the cost-benefit analysis for the energy savings versus um, depreciating the costs of the the capital cost of the system, and it varies from one facility to another. The shortest payoff time is projected to be at um, the teen center with only about a six and a half year payback period, and the longest is about nearly 13 years at the transportation center, and that's just because it's a carport system, which is more expensive than rooftop, and it's the smallest one, so you don't get the same economy of scale. I like, I like the numbers because uh, break-evens before the 20-year fall-off, so this is a good thing. That makes sense all the way. Any other questions from council before I open up to uh, public comment? Super. Madam Clerk, is this now the time to do uh, public comment? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead and call the speaker. We have one speaker, Kat Selm. Kat, you're on. You have, three, you have uh, five minutes. Hi, good evening. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I definitely don't need five minutes. I'm going to be super brief, so I'll give you some time back. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks, and I'm speaking here on behalf of Conejo Climate Coalition. And I just want to show um, some uh, how thrilled we are with this prefab solar project and how happy we are that the city is working towards its goals and enacting its sustainability plan for its municipal operations. And we think it's great, and we're super excited about it, and thank you so much. Thank you very much for your comments. Staff, any uh, comments? No, we appreciate that positive feedback from everybody. Thank you very much. Excellent. So at this point, I'm going to close the hearing and uh, ask for a motion. David, speak up. Councilmember Newman. Thank you, Mayor. I'd, I'd like to move this item. Excellent. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Angler. Yes, and just a quick comment. Um, uh, th this is uh, continuing a long history of multi-year of uh, solar installations and uh, um, I mentioned our Hill Canyon site, which has solar and cogen and all sorts of uh, um, energy producing things. Uh, I'm real happy to be able to say yes to this one. Council Member Newman. As well, a, a brief comment, if I may, to commend staff for doing something that is both um, helping to address our climate crisis and is also saving our residents money in the process. Um, very good work. I'm happy to vote yes on this. Council Member Taylor? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes. If five. we can do for future ones, uh, when I ask for any other comments from Council, if you could do your wonderful comments at that time instead of during the vote, that would be appreciated. I, I was waiting for you to ask that. That's why I had to wait till the vote. Yeah. But uh, um, we did questions and then, so. Very good, my friend. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item 16A. Department reports, we have the Navigation Center, exclusive negotiation agreements and right of entry. For the presentation from staff, we have Assistant City Manager Ingrid Hardy and also Assistant City Attorney Patrick Heher, who will be doing the presentation. And we'll wait while you get settled in there, Ms. Hardy. All righty. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. 
I'm pleased to be here this evening to um, provide the City Council with an update on one of your uh, foremost goals of addressing homelessness. So just as a reminder, the City Council had an adopted priority in 2021-22 to identify and advance solutions for emergency sheltering uh, or for homelessness through emergency sheltering and permanent supportive housing. Um, the city staff has made demonstrable progress towards these two goals, the first of which we were able to secure almost $27 million from the state of California for Project Home Key. And then previously, the city council unanimously authorized the use of city-owned property on Lawrence Drive for future use as a navigation center. I just wanna take a moment to clarify the difference between the two types of housing that we um, are discussing here. Uh, the first one on the right-hand side is the permanent supportive housing, and this is the project located on Conejo Boulevard, at the former Quality Inn and Suites. This is where you combine affordable housing and wraparound supportive services. Tenants sign a lease and pay rent. Over 90% of tenants retain housing and permanently exit homelessness. And it's a less expensive option for addressing unsheltered homelessness. And the goal of permanent supportive housing is stable long-term housing and a productive life. Tonight, the item that is before the city council is for interim housing, which is the navigation center located on Lawrence Drive. Um, with interim housing, typically you're gonna see three types. They're either temporary, winter, or year-round, and in a congregate setting, like a dormitory-style setting, or non-congregate. In our case, we are proposing a year-round shelter that will be in a non-congregate setting. The interim housing will be operated by a nonprofit organization. Uh, On-site meals are provided, supportive services are provided, such as case management and housing navigation services to help the individual locate permanent housing. And they also have access to a host of additional services, such as healthcare, mental health services, and employment services. And the goal is to create a pathway to permanent housing and to end homelessness. This is the site that I previously referenced. You have the street view of the city-owned property on Lawrence Drive. This site is currently being used as a construction staging area, and at the back of the site, we have an existing battery storage facility. The city council previously authorized staff to move forward with the um, team in front of you here on this slide. And there are different roles for these team members. For Dignity Moves, they will serve as the developer of the site. Mini Mansions will serve as the consultant and leaseholder. And Hope of the Valley will serve as the operator for the proposed navigation center. And just a quick review of the qualifications of the team that was selected. Uh, Dignity Moves is a nonprofit organization. They are highly skilled. They have over 150 years of combined experience. They bring expertise in construction, development, finance, fundraising, and technology. Um, the site in front of you here on this picture is actually one of their sites in downtown Santa Barbara, in the heart of downtown. It's surrounded by businesses. Um, it's been open, I wanna say, just under a year. And the adjacent building that you see behind this location is actually the location of Morgan Stanley. And so they are, Dignity Moves developed this site. Salvation Army, I believe, is the operator of this site. And, um, you know, it's just a regular facility. You, you don't know what's behind the wall. Um, in fact, when a team of us visited the site, including our police department, staff from finance, and from the city manager's office, we actually didn't even know that this was the actual site. 
The operator is uh, Copa the Valley Rescue Mission. This is a faith-based nonprofit organization. They have extensive experience in operating tiny home villages. Um, and they are probably one of the larger operators of homeless services, including congregate and non-congregate settings. They have a deep understanding of funding sources and associated requirements. And they also have documented success in taking in individuals experiencing homelessness and providing that pathway to permanent housing. We are all familiar uh, with many mansions and certainly value the experience, the longstanding experience that they bring to the Conejo Valley. They provide affordable housing and they've been doing so since 1979. There are 18 affordable housing communities serving about 1,400 residents. They continue to expand their portfolio throughout Ventura County, Los Angeles County, and other locations throughout the state of California. They are certainly very familiar with our development process and they will be a welcome partner to this effort. Just quickly on the estimated costs and funding sources, which was previously reviewed with the City Council. On the capital side, the proposing team is estimating approximately $3.8 million to develop the site. It is raw land, there's no utilities on the site, so there's grading and you know, a variety of improvements that are required, which is why you see that price tag there. On the operating side, it's just under a million dollars, approximately $900,000 annually to operate the site. Um, I also did not mention previously that the proposed number of beds for this site is 30, and there is uh, room to expand up to 50 in the future should the city council choose to do so. Um, in terms of potential funding sources, the council previously approved a budget of community reinvestment dollars. Uh, there was $16 million set aside. 10 million has gone to the Kilcrest site, which you'll be discussing after this item tonight, and then an additional 1.8 million towards Project Home Key. There's also the state encampment resolution grant which we will be asking the city council to approve the city to be a co-applicant with the county on this grant. It particularly um, targets encampments and it prioritizes encampments that are adjacent or located on state right-of-way. We have the support of our Caltrans liaison to apply for these grant dollars. We've done I should say that the Thousand Oaks Police Department has worked extensively and in partnership with uh, Caltrans and with CHP on addressing our encampments. Uh, so if we're able to secure these dollars, that will certainly help us direct funds um, towards this proposed navigation center. There's also the state permanent local housing allocation dollars along with county competitive and non-competitive grants and also the county cost sharing agreement, which is before the city council this evening. I would like to point out that the board of supervisors unanimously approved the cost sharing agreement with the city of Thousand Oaks. I also would like to let the city council know that they applauded all of you for your leadership in addressing homelessness and for considering the first year round shelter in the East County. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Chief Assistant City Attorney Patrick Heer. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. As part of the recommendation tonight and for the public, we are asking that the council approve an exclusive negotiation agreement, or ENA. Uh, ENA is a good faith negotiation time period. In this case, we are recommending 270 days plus uh, possible extensions. And with the ENA, the city may only negotiate with the proposer uh, as identified by Ms. Hardy during the term of the ENA. Negotiation will include terms for such a uh, long-term lease, operational or service agreements, construction, design, and other obligations. There is a due diligence component to the ENA as to work forward um, to the goal of trying to reach an agreement on that lease 
uh, with the proposer. And that also includes visiting the site and preparing the necessary plans to meet the proposed project task. Uh, as part of the ENA, there is an attached um, right of entry agreement, and we have that attached because we want the proposer to be able to have access to this par part of the parcel to do the necessary analysis for the grading and uh, construction that might happen. It is also important to note that the ENA does not create any rights to acquire or convey the property. This is just a, a prerequisite, if you will, for the uh, parties to negotiate in good faith. The ENA is not an approval of the project, and the CEQA analysis will be done as part of the project review, is not part of this particular action tonight. In addition to the ENA and the right of entry, we have uh, additional recommendations, which Ms. Hardy will go through in her conclusion. Thank you. So there are a number of recommendations before the City Council this evening. The first is to approve the exclusive negotiation agreement between the City and the proposer for the development of the Navigation Center. The second one is to approve the right of entry agreement. The third recommendation is to authorize the City to be identified as a co-applicant on the County's grant application for the State Encampment Resolution Grant. The fourth recommendation is to authorize the city manager to initiate the preparation of the agreements that Mr. Heher mentioned, including the lease agreement, the operation and service agreements, and other ancillary documents. Uh, the fifth recommendation is to authorize the city manager to execute the cost sharing agreement that I mentioned was approved by the Board of Supervisors this evening. And finally, to find that this action is not a project as defined under CEQA. We have uh, several city staff members available to answer questions. Jamie Boscarino, our finance director, of course, Patrick, and myself. We also have two um, county staff members that are available to answer questions as well, Jennifer Harkey and Christy Madden. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Council members, any questions? None? Oh, we have one. Council Member Ringler. Thank you for the good presentation and um, looking forward to this getting off the ground. Um, you, in the staff report, you mentioned uh, some, some goals. Uh, I think it was 75% or 70% of the, uh, the housing always occupied, 75% moving people into permanent housing or permanent uh, situations. Um, is that aspirational? Is that something that Hope of the Valley has accomplished on a regular basis? So the goals that you're referencing are part of the county cost sharing agreement. And these are the standard goals that they have in other cost sharing agreements. Um, I would say they're, yes, they're aspirational, but certainly attainable. Well, thank you. And then the, we have 30, 30 uh, modular uh, homes going in out there. Is that 30 beds? Is there room for couples in these places? Is uh, And then the second part of that question, we do have some families in the area that are homeless. Is this intended for families or is there other accommodations made for them? So yes, there are 30 beds that will be available. We can accommodate couples. Uh, we are not, in terms of serving families, the families would not include children under the age of 18. That is our, our preference. We think that a different site um, would be more appropriate for families with younger children. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Taylor. Okay, so as of right now, you know, when we're looking at the cost, we don't know if this project will even pencil at this moment. This is just to basically enter in to the negotiations to find out if we have a viable project and, and ultimately the deal with the operator. Is that correct or am I missing that? So we do, through our request for proposals, the Dignity Moves did provide a line item budget of what they believe are the costs to develop the site. So um, could those costs change potentially, but this is what they believe the cost to be at this time. 
The action that the city council will take this evening is to exclusively negotiate with the proposer, Dignity Moves, Mini Mansions, and Hope of the Valley. As, as part of that proposal, within the first 90 days, they are supposed to provide us with their financing proposal. Okay. And then when we come back to the city council, we should have additional uh, numbers. Um, Maybe Jamie wants to make other comments. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So uh, this project, unlike um, the one that you're gonna see next, will be funded either fully by the city with the county's contribution that they approved this morning or this afternoon of 50% of construction, 50% of operations. And then we're hopeful, as Ingrid mentioned, that we'll get the state encampment resolution grant, which potentially, if we did receive that grant, would fund the entire construction and potentially up to two and a half years of operating costs as well. Um, because this is a city project, uh, we would be funding with the county support half of future operating costs. And if we didn't get the state encampment grant, we would fund half of the construction. So it is fully funded. We do have the budget for it. We're going through our budget process right now. So we will be budgeting for the next two years for half of the operating costs as well. In the case that we don't get the state encampment grant. Um, and she also mentioned there's other state funding that we, um, it's about a half a million a year. So if we don't get the encampment grant, we would use that half a million that we would be getting from the state that we could apply to this project as well. So it would essentially make the city's costs, as long as we have that um, state funding, zero for operations. Okay. Thank you. And if I may, Mr. Taylor, um, the when we had the proposals done, when we selected the, the proposer team that we are working on with the ENA, what happened with that is that they created a, a proposed project that we look at and we say, yes, this is something that we think would work. And so the lease agreement and these other agreements that we're working on is, is gonna be using that proposal as part of the analysis that we're doing. So that's like the, the initial set of information that we have and then we use that to help us do the fine tuning of it with the, the lease. So a lease versus a purchase, um, uh, the service agreement. We have to work with the county as a partnership with the county to make sure that we are complying with some of the goals and policies that they need to have followed through when we do this with the with anyone that we work with. So that's kind of now we're getting to the nuts and bolts of the terms of an agreement, what it means, the long how long it goes, termination issues, liability issues, all those kind of things now come into play. But the initial structure of it was from the proposal, and we again thought this was a, a very successful proposal team, and that's why we're trying to get in front of them right now, in front of you, I should say. Great, thank you. I have a few questions. Ms. Boscarino, maybe this is for you or for Ms. Hardy. We are paying 50%, county is paying 50%. Is that a fair statement? Is that accurate? Yes, that would be the case if we do not secure grant dollars. My challenge here is that the county has the money for social programs for the homeless. Why are they not paying 100% of the costs associated with it given they've got the property tax dollars that go into social programs and so forth. Why are we as a city doing this and not saying, here's the plan, we will execute this faithfully. County, you pay 100% of it as compared to we pay 50%. Sure, so I'll start out and, and then Drew or Jamie can chime in. In 2018, the city council adopted a regional memorandum of understanding with the county along with other cities in Ventura County. And as part of that agreement, we agreed to work with the county on addressing homelessness, including uh, sheltering, permanent supportive housing, asking that nonprofit organizations utilize their database system. So it was approached as a collective partnership and that we could move the needle further in addressing homelessness by partnering between the county and the city. Was there a fee agreement at, at, at that time? Because I could see the energy from the city put forth to assist the county in, in addressing homelessness, that I get. But again, they have the dollars, the purse strings, to address homelessness. And to ask the residents of Thousand Oaks who don't have the dollars coming in from property taxes to address that, county takes care of social programs. Why are we asking our taxpayers to do that, and Mr. Powers, perhaps you can answer that. Sure, I'll be happy to take a take a swing at it. Um, 
So uh, to answer the question, no, no financial commitments were made as part of the, um, the memorandum of understanding. And the reason that is is because the scale of homelessness varies widely between jurisdictions. Um, a lot of the count West County locations have a lot more uh, those there are those that are unhoused in those uh, those locations. Those same cost sharing agreements exist in each jurisdiction. Oxnard and Ventura both have cost sharing agreements. The county does, as you uh, appropriately point out, uh, they do provide social services. And so they have a clinic here in uh, that is in Thousand Oaks. They provide behavioral health uh, support. Um, law enforcement support to us via contract. And so from that standpoint, the question of housing homeless ends up one of those that straddles the line. There are components that are social service, absolutely are. And the county in partnership here is going to be supporting that, not just in financial means, but also providing likely on-site clinic services um, at, the, uh, at the eventual facility and behavioral health support services uh, at, those, at that facility. On the other side, it's a housing question. And housing questions are traditionally municipal responsibilities. And so that's where this, this one really straddles the, the line policy-wise. Thank you. Council, any other questions? Very good. We have uh, no speakers, is that correct for this? Correct. Very good. So, staff, any uh, responses, any uh, last-minute comments before we move forward? No additional comments. Thank you. Council, any discussion, any comments here? Councilman Ringler? Oh, I'm sorry, you thought you indicated you wanted to say something. I can always say something. <laughs> this, this is, uh, and we've talked about this before, there are, there are many portions of how to address uh, our uh, unhoused population in our city. Um, part of what we're going to discuss uh, a little bit later is another aspect of it. The um, location over the, the uh, permit supportive housing on Conejo Boulevard is another portion of it. Um, just providing more housing in general is another portion of it. Um, this is intended for those people who are currently experiencing homelessness who need that bridge to get them back on uh, track for permanent housing. So this is another part of what we are attempting to do to work f through our, our issues here of homelessness in our town. I think it's a vital part of what we're gonna be looking at to do. So um, I, I, I see nothing but good. I think it's money well spent. Uh, many of our, I mean, we all have received uh, emails uh, concerning homelessness uh, in our town. Um, this is one way to partner with the county to address our local issues here in, in the Conejo Valley. Uh, I think it's a good, a, good, a good approach for us to take this multifaceted, multi-winged approach to uh, addressing homelessness. Um, with that, I, I'd be happy to make a motion and we could talk about the motion. Sure, we, we can do a motion, but other comments from other council members. You bet, you bet. Right. No, I would, I would move all, all, I think it was six items um, yes, sir. To, uh, to, to approve, move all to six items. We have a comment by Councilmember Newman. I want to begin by thanking staff for, for bringing, bringing this to the point we're at and thanking Councilmember Engler, whose comments I, I fully concur with. Um, I've had many conversations uh, with, with our staff, with the county's uh, medical backpack team, with Chief Paris, um, with Mr. Schrader from Many Mansions, um, with many other people who are in our community addressing homelessness. And, and I've asked them the question, what do you need to do your job? And separately, they've all given me exactly the same answer, which is we need housing and we need services. And that's what we're doing tonight. And as Council Member Engler pointed out, it is a multi-factor multivariate problem, and we are addressing it in multiple ways. But I fully agree that this is an important part of it. So I'm, I'm very happy to support the motion on that ground. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Adam. Oh, thank you, Mayor. You know, I did visit the uh, modular housing in Santa Barbara, and uh, it's done beautifully. Uh, it filled instantly as soon as they opened it, and uh, it coexists with the surrounding people 
very well. So I'm sure that's what's gonna happen here. Um, this just shows you the commitment the city council and our staff, and Ingrid, you've been with us since day one. Thank you so much for your tenacity in getting these things done. To, uh, commitment to help homeless people and a greater commitment to provide affordable housing. I mean, this is one facet of affordable housing. And um, I'm really encouraged that the county has stepped in and to contribute because what that could mean, if you, if you remember, we voted for 30, but we also voted to increase to as much as 50. And with the county uh, support, hopefully maybe we won't have to commit to 50, but I, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility, but with the county involved, that's gonna make that a lot easier. So uh, fully supported the motion. Thank you, sir. I would like to say that I am very much supportive of temporary supportive housing to help people get a leg up, get back in the game again, have purpose in life, to be functional, productive, and self-reliant, independent. And this project, in my opinion, meets those goals. Ms. Hardy, Ms. Boscarino, Mr. Eher and our city staff, thank you so much for the diligent work that you've done on bringing it to this point. I personally would like staff to consider moving towards 50, even though we are right now at 30. Unfortunately, we have 300, approximately, homeless in our city and growing. So the 77 we have over at the Quality Inn, the 50 we have that we're talking about here, which is actually 30 right now, is nowhere gonna be close, but it's a step in the right direction. I'm hoping that we can address all the homeless and get them back into life, being productive, having purpose, being self-reliant. So uh, City Manager, uh, Mr. Powers, any comments? I uh, just that you know with that I think the as we had our community outreach conversations we tried to be really thoughtful and measured about the fact that we wanted to demonstrate success we're confident in, in the operator team's ability here and certainly the site is raw land today so we'll be pulling utilities and doing a lot of construction work there everything that we're doing is is not going to preclude the council's eventual ability to look to expand should they wish uh, should they wish to do so but uh, we we do think it's important to demonstrate our success in a, in a measured way to start and be prepared for future expansion as we move forward. And just as a final comment for myself is that our challenge here in Thousand Oaks is where to put it. And this is an ideal place for this effort. Hopefully we can identify others that are just as accommodating. We have a motion on the floor by Council Member Engler. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Council Member Engler? Yes. Council Member Newman? Yes. Council Member Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5-0. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the Hillcrest site exclusive negotiating agreement. <clears throat> up for city staff to make a presentation is our finance director, Jamie Boscarino, and our assistant city attorney, Noel Doran. And available for questions, Cheryl Flores, Vice President of Home Ownership, at People's Self-Help Housing Corporation via Zoom. And also Linda Braunschweiger, Housing Trust Fund, Ventura County. Ms. Boscarino, it's yours. Good evening, Mayor McNamee, Council Members. Tonight we are here before you on the Hillcrest Site Exclusive Negotiating Agreement. With me tonight is Noel Duran, our Assistant City Attorney, as well as representatives from People's Self-Help Housing Corporation and from the Housing Trust Fund and Housing Land Trust of Ventura County. The city has a long history of supporting affordable housing, and in fact, goal J of the city council goals states in part that the city will continue to support production of long-term affordable housing. Prior to the dissolution of redevelopment agencies in 2012, the city's RDA supported the development of over 1,000 affordable housing units. The city consistently partnered with agencies, primarily many mansions, to develop affordable housing projects contributing millions of dollars towards this purpose. Although the city's RDA was dissolved, this city council goal still remains to this day. As part of the goal setting in 2021, city council adopted priority number four for fiscal year 2021-22, which called for the investment in the post-pandemic recovery through various strategic one-time non-recurring investments due to receipt of ARPA funding from the federal government. 
In order to work towards achieving that goal, City Council approved as part of the 2021-2023 budget, 16 million towards affordable housing and homelessness efforts as well as um, other initiatives. City Council then adopted priority number four for fiscal year 2022-23, specifically related to the Hillcrest Site Affordable Housing Development Project. The Hillcrest site is located at the corner of Hillcrest and Herbs, close to the Civic Arts Plaza here and downtown Thousand Oaks. It is a 3.87 acre parcel zoned R3 multifamily residential that housed the former Hillcrest Christian School, which will be demolished as part of the development. Staff evaluated the site when it was on the market and determined that it would be a suitable location for the development of affordable housing. On August 31st, 2021, City Council approved the purchase and sale agreement for the Hillcrest site. Escrow subsequently closed on November 10th, 2021. Then on May 24th, 2022, City Council adopted a resolution to declare the Hillcrest site as exempt surplus land pursuant to the Surplus Lands Act. After direction from City Council, staff proceeded to develop and issue an RFPQ for development of the Hillcrest site as an affordable housing project. Based on this direction, preference was given for the development of an all for sale affordable housing project and an all electric design. Staff evaluated proposals for the economic viability and financial strength of the proposer and the development, as well as the expertise and experience of the development team. Also evaluated was the vision and design for a market feasible affordable housing development, implementing the city's vision for the community. The city then issued the RFPQ on June 24th, 2022. Staff received four proposals and after a lengthy and thorough evaluation, recommended the city select People's Self-Help Housing Corporation as the developer for the for sale affordable housing project. On November 1st, 2022, City Council approved staff, staff, staff recommendation and selected People's Self-Help and authorized the City Manager to begin preparation of an exclusive negotiating agreement. People's Self-Help Housing's proposal included an all-for-sale affordable de development project of 78 units with a mix of low-income and moderate-income units. The proposal fulfilled the requirements of the Surplus Lands Act, was market feasible with sound financial assumptions and reasonable development costs. They partnered with the Housing Trust Fund and Housing Land Trust of Ventura County, Ventura County Community Development Corporation as the Home Ownership Counselor, DiCecco Architecture as the architect, and McCarthy Companies as the builder. And now I'll turn it over to Noel to go over the exclusive negotiating agreement. Thank you. Before the City Council this evening are an exclusive, exclusive negotiating agreement and an associated right of entry agreement between the City and People's Self-Help Housing Corporation. The exclusive negotiating agreement, or ENA, memorializes the party's agreement to exclusively negotiate in good faith the development of an affordable housing project on the Hillcrest site. The ENA establishes the framework for these negotiations. It establishes a negotiating term of 180 days However, there are options to extend that period. During that time, the parties will further refine the project details, including the development schedule, the project financing, and the disposition of the site to the developer. The ENA also makes clear that the costs associated with the project, including any due diligence, project planning, and environmental review, are the sole responsibility of the developer. To assist people's self-help, due diligence efforts, the City Council is asked to approve a right of entry agreement. This will allow people self-help and their contractors to enter the site to perform any necessary physical tests and inspections. It should be noted that tonight's item is not an approval of a project. The ENA starts a negotiating period that will hopefully result in a mutually agreeable disposition and development agreement that will be brought to the City Council for consideration at a future meeting. So we have several recommendations before you tonight. The first is to approve the exclusive no negotiating agreement between the City of Thousand Oaks and People's Self-Help Housing Corporation for the development of the city-owned parcel on herbs as a for-sale affordable housing project. 
The second recommendation is to approve the right of entry agreement between the city and People Self Help Housing Corporation for the development of the city owned parcel as a for sale affordable housing project. The third is to authorize the city manager to initiate preparation of a disposition and development agreement between the city and People Self Help. And then the fourth is to find that this action is not a project as defined under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, with that, we have staff available for questions as well as a representative from People's Self-Help and um, also from the Land Trust. Thank you for the presentation. Council, any questions? Mr. Uh, Taylor? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, who's, cover who's covering the cost or who's responsible for the cost until the point of uh, us approving or, or not that the land will be moved into the trust? So um, part of the ENA, and then Noel can add anything further, um, any costs are to be solely absorbed by people's self-help. So they are responsible for any and all costs that are associated um, through the period of the ENA and then after that fact. Okay. Okay, so by entering this, we have no financial risk uh, if this isn't a viable project. And you said this is, uh, we have potentially s or labeled 78 units or 78 townhomes available? Yeah, based on the zoning of the parcel, the minimum would be 78. And so their proposal was for 78. As we go through the process, you know, it could potentially be more than that, but the ENA prescribes that they have to have a minimum of 78 units. Is, has there been a, a I don't know if you want to call it a study or, is there a potential to have this be a different uh, uh, asset? So is there an, a scenario where we could put potentially more doors as a multifamily to be able to provide more supply? And, and has there been any kind of comparison to see if that's actually a better uh, option to bring more availability than potentially a limited townhome or a smaller amount of units on the townhome size side? Uh, I, I will say, and maybe we let people self-help um, jump in and respond to this question as well. The number, the units, you have one bedrooms all the way up to four bedrooms. So we can accommodate, you know, families with four bedrooms. Um, I don't know if, if people self-help, if Cheryl wants to add anything yeah. else. And, I see and maybe I'll add one other piece to that, just as, uh, some background context. So we did do a, a RFP, RFQ process, and uh, received a number of proposers. Proposers ranged, and that RFP was um, directed based on council's uh, policy direction. Council prescribed um, uh, a desire for for sale, okay. um, and so, uh, and, um, as we went through the process, that was certainly weighted in the process. And okay. so uh, while um, one of the submissions, at least one of the submissions, did have a blending um, of, a, uh, of some uh, rental multifamily to blend in with some for sale, uh, the council elected to move forward with this one for a variety of reasons, most notably the strength of the overall team. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, because there's going to be a... Uh, how, how would I say this correctly? A cap on, on I don't know if it's going to be a cap or a minimum, but there's a, a ceiling on who can qualify, let's say. Uh, and if this asset appreciates for more than they have in, where does that excess, let's call it capital, go on a sale? I'm assuming it's going into the trust, or does it go back to the person who, who bought it? So um, when they initially purchase it, obviously there's a cap on what we can establish the purchase, the sales price at based on their income levels. They could stay in that townhouse, let's say 10 years. Um, at that point in time, there would be a new calculation as to what they could sell the property for, which would be under market, right? Because these are preserved as low income and moderate income units so it would be under what a market would pay for it um, but they're not getting it's not like they're getting sold at a market price and then somewhere that difference between what they actually get is and what a market price is they're not being sold at that so there really isn't so it's cap in cap out yeah. right uh, so for that extra let me see how I could explain this because uh, I'm actually trying to figure it out as well let's say you know in theory market value is a million dollars right, day one, and 
they're getting in for, let's say, 700000 I know these numbers are just made up, but that $300,000, let's say, just keeps carrying on with appreciation. Where does, does that margin, if, if value is worth more when they sell it, go anywhere? Are you saying when they sell it, even that sale is capped, where it, they're not going to sell it for market value? Correct. Okay. And I don't know um, if Linda or Cheryl maybe want to add any more context to your question. I know they're both online. Cheryl uh, Flores of uh, People's Self-Help, would you like to um, enter an explanation here for the council member? Um, I'll try. I think Jamie did explain it. We had proposed that there would be uh, the, the resale could increase as much as the percent AMI during that period. That's not locked down yet. It's still up for discussion. But definitely the resale would be capped for an extended period. We propose 45 years so that the buyers get some appreciation, but they don't get a windfall profit. Okay. And the units stay affordable long term, which is what the city asked for. Okay. Thank you for that. And we'll move on to the next council member question. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and for the work on getting this agreement before us. Um, I'm really, have, it's, it's more a clarification than a question um, for the public's benefit. When people hear the terms low income or affordable housing, um, in my experience, they sometimes tend to correlate that with destitution and poverty and extreme situations. Um, but we're not talking about that here, are we? Where, where in, by the state's definition, countywide in Ventura, not here in Thousand Oaks, but countywide, can you confirm that low income for a family of four here is, are we using the HCD definitions where low income is more than $100,000 a year for a family of four and moderate income, I think, is up to 137 or 138 something like that? I don't have them on hand. I don't know. Cheryl, do you have the numbers for the county? I do not have them in front of me, but it's substantial yeah. um, what the 80 and 120 percent AMIs are. The families have to have enough income to make the payment. I and mean, even if the homes are sold for 350000 that still requires a substantial income, probably of at least around 70000 um, depending on interest rates and everything else. So yeah. they will be working family. So we are we are all working off the state HCD income limits. For, right, and you right. know this yeah. is teachers. I mean, we we talked right. about this at teachers, the last presentation. Teachers, firefighters, exactly. Medical technicians. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're not we're not talking about desperate poverty here. Very good. I just wanted to confirm that. Thank thanks very much, Mayor. I'd like to come back to that point and that my last look at the uh, table for Ventura County to qualify for low income housing which is what we're discussing here, is a combined income of $90,000. $90,000 combined income for an individual or married couple or people within. And then we have, it's just under $90,000. So as, as we talk here about the affordability of it, my question for staff is, how do we go about selecting who's gonna win the lottery here who now would get a million dollar townhome for four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars which was made at the presentation originally because our taxpayers paid ten million dollars for that property and that is why it's able to be contributed or priced out at about half the price of on the market again on the market it was eight hundred to a million dollars for a townhome but these will be going out approximately at four hundred to maybe four fifty five hundred thousand and that's a lottery win for somebody. How do we decide on which 77 lucky people won the lottery, get into a home at half price here in Thousand Oaks? How do we do that? So I'm gonna let, so that process as prescribed by this will be run by uh, people self-help who do this in all their jurisdictions. But I think it's important to point out there is a process for all of the affordable housing projects that the council advances. So 299, which just opened uh, 12 affordable units uh, in there. And so 
they had a third party that runs that. They run all the income qualifications and they run uh, all the, the lottery process associated uh, with that. But perhaps our representative from People's uh, no, just, mind If I may just uh, also comment on that, Mr. Powers, is that 299 are rental units, which I am supportive for low income housing, not purchase. And that's the difference here. So I'm looking forward to staff. Any comments on that? No, as, as Drew mentioned, this will be run by people's self-help. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Cheryl, if they know their process yet at this point, but um, we can certainly ask Cheryl if they have it identified already. But like Drew mentioned, this is something that they have done multiple times before. So uh, they will take care of the selection process and move forward with it. Again, I voted no on this originally because it was for, per, for purchase for low income. And my argument was that if this was available on the market, there would be seven, se 77 families that would be able to live there who could afford to live here at market rate. However, this is going to low income folks because the city purchased the land for $10 million and could offer it at half price. And that again creates a whole new group of 77 people who would love to live in Thousand Oaks, qualified for it, earned, saved, have a down payment but they're not gonna be here because they didn't make low enough amount of money. I'm in favor of rental, but not ownership. So let's do the following here. And council, any other questions or comments? Let's move into, if we can, for speakers. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? No speakers then. Staff, any um, last comments here? Any thoughts? No. Okay, so I'm gonna ask for any other final comments before we ask for a motion? Mr. Adam. Motion and discussion. Yes. Area. Yes. Just want to make, clarify. Um, anyway. Um, hey, uh, just another example of the city's commitment to affordable housing. Uh, we just heard modular housing uh, for homeless folks. Uh, we also know we did a permanent supportive housing project, the Quality Inn. Uh, there's over 100 units. Now, that's truly affordable. Um, we have, in the last year, approved uh, about 120 affordable units. Is that right, Drew? Somewhere around that number? About 114. Yeah. 114, thank you. 114 affordable units uh, for the rental side. And I can tell you, some of them are truly affordable. Uh, the 299 project, the affordable units there are going between 700 and 1,000 a month. That's going to be uh, very helpful to some people. And now we're, we, we're looking at another tier of affordability f for ownership. And uh, you know, I know the public wants affordable. It's not easy to provide, a as you can see, especially with land costs in Thousand Oaks as high as they are, the city s chose, with the city council's direction, to step in and support this project by purchasing the land and taking that cost out. And so now, 75, 80 people are going to be able to buy a condominium below market, but these folks are also going to have to qualify. They're going to have to get a mortgage. They're going to have to make payments just like everybody else, but they're going to get a start here in the city. And that's really hard to do these days, but thanks to this council, they're going to be able to do that, and they're going to be able to appreciate, uh, <laughs> appreciate some appreciation. That doesn't make sense. They're going to be able to benefit some appreciation from home ownership as well. So I think it's a good move by us, and I, I will move uh, that we go ahead with the ENA for 16B. We have a motion for um, 16B. Any other final comments? Mr. Newman. I concur with Council Member Adam about the high cost of land here, and we can address that in two ways. We can be really irresponsible and do everything we can to wreck our local economy so that all costs, land costs come down because nobody wants to live here anymore. Or we can do the responsible thing, which, which is to provide housing at all different income levels. And I think our city has committed to doing that. I applaud them for doing that. If you talk with our partners in the business community, um, they are telling us that we need housing at all different income levels, not only to rent, but also to buy. And this, to me, is a far better choice than a deep recession or a deep depression that, that 
market forces bring the economy to a quite bad place. Our economy is very strong, and we are in a fortunate position where we can do something about housing for people who need it. So I'm happy to support Council Members Adams' motion. Thank you. Any other? Mr. Taylor. Uh, I'll just add, uh, yeah. I, I agree with, I agree with, I think everyone here that affordable housing or, or maybe better said, the cost of housing is too expensive right now. Uh, I, I think I have a, maybe a different opinion on how we get there. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in uh, a reason of why the cost is so expensive is because it's so difficult to build, uh, specifically in California. Uh, with that said, right now we're not approving a project, we're approving uh, an opportunity to negotiate and, and ultimately see what this project looks like. Uh, but I guess I'll, I'll finish with that. I, I, I agree that there's a need, maybe we have a different opinion on how it gets there. Mr. Ringler. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I agree 100% with Mr. Taylor. I think this is um, another step along the way of uh, taking this, uh, this idea to a fruition. Uh, so we're not approving it tonight per se. We are taking that next step, which I think is an important step to take. Uh, that said, um, this is, as I said earlier, this is one more um, approach that we are taking to help make uh, housing more affordable in Thousand Oaks. This is a for sale product and uh, uh, it it's gives, rather than no people, 78 to 80 people the opportunity. Um, I think that's a worthwhile effort on our part, especially connected with all the other efforts we're making to provide affordable housing within our community. Um, with that said, I think I would wholeheartedly uh, take this next step because if we don't take this next step, we won't get to our goal. Thank you. I would like to uh, conclude my comment in that I'm very much in support of rentable, affordable housing for low income, not for ownership because we exclude others and that's making government into a charity, which is not our function. And I agree with Councilman Taylor in that I agree that we need to address the affordability issue. I have other means that I think we should do as a government entity and not be a charity. But our council has voted four to one to purchase that land and make it, uh, actually five zero to purchase the land, but four to one to make it uh, for purchase low income housing that will be ownership as compared to rental. So we have a motion on the floor, but I'd like to move, turn it over to our assistant city attorney, uh, Patrick Keher, for a, a question comment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so for Mr. Adam, I just want to make sure we're clear for the record that your, your motion actually included the four requests that Ms. Ms. Boscarino stated and that are in the packet, correct? They did. Thank you. They did. And since I'm speaking, just one quick comment. Uh, I want to thank People's Self-Health Housing Great organization. I think the headline said uh, Thousand Oaks is using a dream team to get this done, and you're part of that dream, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Adam. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll? Councilmember Angler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes 5 0. Excellent. Let's move on to 16C inclusionary housing program. For the presentation from city staff, uh, Ian Holt, senior planner. We also have Kathy Head, consultant from Kaiser uh, Martson. And available for questions will be Calvin Parker, our community development uh, department director, and Tom Bretz, consultant for Kaiser Martson. Mr. Holt, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just give us a moment to get situated. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do this for a moment. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Mayor, Council Members. So uh, before you tonight, uh, staff is uh, basically seeking uh, input from the City Council on the Inclusionary Housing Program and Non-Residential Development Linkage Fee Update. Um, we're seeking City Council's policy direction towards the preparation of an update to both programs, including um, considering introducing a non-residential linkage fee based on the feasibility analysis and the preliminary recommendations uh, contained in your staff report. So as I said, the request before you is first to um, discuss the inclusionary housing financial evaluation as well as the uh, linkage fee nexus study results and the preliminary recommendations contained therein and then ultimately provide uh, direction to staff on completing the updates for the inclusionary housing ordinance as well as the non-residential linkage fee ordinances. Updating the program furthers the city's effort towards producing affordable housing in a manner commensurate with new market rate development. As part of the city council's adopted six cycle housing element, the affordable housing development program uh, included an object objective to update the inclusionary housing program and linkage fees. Updating the program assists the city in reaching its regional housing needs assessment numbers for the affordable housing which for the sixth cycle uh, housing element from 2021 to 2029 are 735 very low income, which actually roughly half of that is extremely low income. Then you have 494 low income units and 532 moderate income units, all of which those categories meet um, affordability criteria. So back in November, Council provided uh, direction in the general parameters um, for the preparation of the financial feasibility studies. The city's consultant, Kaiser Marston Associates, evaluated the financial feasibility uh, by re of requiring construction of and also other con contribution options towards furthering the production of affordable housing. The preliminary recommendations before you tonight are a result of a conservative approach to applying requirements that are commensurate to the different types of residential development. Also included for the council's consideration is a policy, consider policy of applying non-residential development linkage fees. The goal of the update and the evaluation is to avoid placing an onerous burden on developers. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, placing an onerous burden on developers by providing options to contribute towards the production of affordable housing. The development of these recommendations are justified by the financial analysis presented tonight uh, and are intended not to be overly strict to the degree that they become an impediment to the production of housing. When considering these preliminary recommendations, staff solicits the council to strike a balance between the affordable housing and the economic development goals of the community. The policy direction received tonight by, from the City Council to staff will be used to develop a draft ordinance for the update to the municipal code sections uh, related to inclusionary housing as well as the um, linkage fee. And then also any resolutions establishing any in lieu or linkage fee amounts. These items would be considered by the Planning Commission for recommendation followed by um, the final consideration by City Council at a future meeting. Now I'd like to turn over the presentation to Kathy Head to cover the inclusionary housing program, then followed by Tim Bretz to cover the non-residential linkage fee. There'll be an opportunity for questions after each of their presentations. And um, after those presentations, we can um, conclude by going over the final direction from city council. Thanks. Can I do the page down thing instead? Oh, great. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members, and I've lost the presentation. There we go. Um, wow, how did I get to page six? Okay. Sorry. Um, my name is Kathy Head. I'm president of Kaiser Marston, and I manage the firm's affordable housing practice. As you can see, PowerPoint is not my primary strength. Um, so I just wanted to go back over a number of things that we talked about earlier at our last meeting. I know there are a couple new council members and it's always just good to review where we are on the inclusionary housing issue in general. 
So to start with, the foundational concepts are over 170 jurisdictions in California currently include an inclusionary housing program, and in fact, it's more than that now because with housing elements in the last couple of years, a number of new jurisdictions have, have added in new inclusionary housing programs, um, but nobody keeps a good count. I can't find a good count. Um, so it's over 170. Um, but you can only expect an inclusionary housing program to fulfill a small part of your unmet need. It's just one tool in providing affordable housing for the community because you're asking the development community to provide it as part of their market rate development. And so it's important to, to keep your expectations reasonable with what that component of the market can do to create affordable housing units. So um, I have a survey of 93 California jurisdictions that have inclusionary housing programs, and I just want to go over sort of the general concepts that come out of that survey that the more um, normal or typical requirements that are being imposed by these programs throughout the state. Um, so threshold project size means what size market rate project would be subject to the inclusionary housing obligation. And so the, in the survey of the 93 jurisdictions, the thresholds typically range between three and 10 units. There are some jurisdictions that have it set at one. There are some jurisdictions that have it set at 50. But typically, it runs somewhere between three and 10 units. The average and median threshold sizes are seven. Seven is the average and five is the number of units. So that gives you some context on what size projects would be subject to the inclusionary housing. The income and affordability restrictions, again, vary widely among the jurisdictions, but the majority of the pro programs that have been surveyed, some fall between 10 and 20% as the set aside for affordable housing. They also, those percentages that are being assessed also vary based on how deep the affordability is that's being required. So the percentage can be higher when you're doing moderate income requirement than they can when you're doing a very low income requirement because we're dealing in what the gaps are and we'll, we'll talk about that more. Um, also the thing to think about is that smaller projects bear a greater burden from an inclusionary housing policy than larger projects because in a 10 unit project, setting aside one unit, is a major impact on your economics, whereas in a 60 unit project setting six units aside isn't as big a, an impact. And so it's just important to think when you're doing this, when you're setting your threshold project size that will be subject to inclusionary, plus the, what sort of incentives or benefits that you'll give to small projects to not create a constraint to development and not to impede it from happening. Um, covenant periods, um, they're commonly range at 45 years for ownership and 55 years for rental. Those are old redevelopment standards, and so they got picked up by a lot of, a lot of programs. I've seen them, in fact, I was in Ventura last night, I've seen them being discussed as perpetual, um, and I've seen them shorter. Oxnard is currently 20, although they're working on increasing it right now, they're talking about 55. Um, so shorter and longer periods are applied in some jurisdictions. Really the most common are 45 and 55. 45 for ownership, 55 for rental. So then I narrowed it down to Southern California jurisdictions and there are 32 cities and counties in the survey that are in the Southern California area. And those, as I mentioned before, the threshold project sizes range for, uh, to as high as 50 units and but 15 of those 32 programs, it's set at five or fewer units. So that gives you another sense of where these programs are going. Um, five units is a fairly typical threshold because the state density bonus also sets its threshold at five. So you, you see that sometimes as the rationale for setting the, the threshold there. Um, in the Southern California jurisdictions, the inclusionary housing requirements range from, from 4% to 30%. But 28, 28 out of those jurisdictions have a requirement between 10 and 20%. And then typically ownership um, affordable programs and, and inclusionary programs are focused on moderate income households and that's because moderate income households have more disposable income to spend on housing over time and the ownership costs that go along with owning units over time, and so it, it just tends to be more feasible to set the requirement at the moderate income level. 
Comparatively, apartment projects are typically set at the very low and low income level uh, because, again, then the rents are set accordingly. They're not bearing any home ownership costs. They're not paying property taxes. They're not paying maintenance, et cetera. So it's possible to set those standards at a lower income level than is, is typical or recommended, in, in my opinion, for ownership units. Um, again, the, the covenant periods are 45 to 55 years for ownership and we're 55 years for apartments. And all of the 32 programs in the survey offer an in lieu fee option. And the reason for that is when the, when the legislature and the court cases have come through, they've made it very clear that there need to be options. So you can't only require on-site production. You need to provide other options for the way in which this requirement can be fulfilled. You don't have to make them easy to use. They don't have to be by right. But you can have specific criteria that you establish for these options, but there need to be options. And the most common option is in Luffy. I haven't seen a program yet that hasn't had some form of an in Luffy. They range all the way from every developer who wants to use one can to city council has to hear it and determine there's an extreme economic hardship. And so th those are the options. Um, and there are different ways they're assessed, but we'll get into that more. So as I mentioned, there's been legislation and there have been court cases on inclusionary. This has been an evolving practice over time over the last 30 plus years. And they really solidified inclusionary with, with two things. With the San Jose case that said, that um, went to California Supreme Court, and they said, inclusionary is a planning tool, it's not an exaction. And so you, it gave cities and counties the ability to impose inclusionary housing requirements as a planning requirement based on producing affordable housing units as its primary function. The other key piece of legislation then was AB 1505 in 2017. And that allowed jurisdictions to impose inclusionary units on apartment projects. Between 2009 and 2017, cities and counties could not impose inclusionary requirements on rental due to a court case in Los Angeles. Um, it was the Palmer case. This is an AB 1505 is known as the Palmer fix. And that case was based on the notion that inclusionary was a form of rent control and rent control wasn't allowed. So what the legislature said in 2017 is, we're going to allow it to override the Costa Hawkins, which imposes the rent control requirements. So in 2017, then you got the ability to do rental again, which you hadn't had since 2009. Those are the two key things that have really solidified inclusionary in the landscape. But what they've told you is the legal, the legal standards that are imposed are the requirements cannot be confiscatory and the requirements cannot deprive an owner of a fair and reasonable return on their investment. Now, the sad thing about that is they haven't told us what that means. So we're left on our own to judge what that means and what confiscatory means and what not depriving an owner of a fair and reasonable return are. And as Ian mentioned at the, at the beginning, that's a large part of the reason that Kaiser Marston will always do a conservative analysis because we don't want to set up a situation where the jurisdiction runs afoul of the, of the court decision and the statutory rules. And so, and the other issue is that we want to balance developers' interests against the, the obvious unmet need for affordable housing. There's no question that, no one's debating. No one's debating that there's a large need for affordable housing. But then if a developer won't build in your community, then you get no affordable units. And so that balancing act is really important. In the, real, the strength of the real estate in Thousand Oaks, you've got a great real estate market. So you're in a position to have some flexibility in the programs that you adopt. Okay, as I mentioned before, um, inclusionary housing programs typically set the requirement for ownership units at moderate income. And then with AB 1505, which I just mentioned in terms of rental, is what AB 1505 did was it provided an example in the statute that said you can provide 15% low income units at, 15% uh, at a low income requirement. What they basically said, they used it as an example in AB 1505, but subsequently the Housing and Community Development Department of the State of California wrote a technical memorandum that said, no, we meant that. 
So what they're saying is they don't want you to do something stricter, and if you want to do something stricter, then you better be able to prove that the stricter isn't confiscatory, doesn't deprive an owner of a fair and reasonable return on their investment, and is not a constraint to housing. And so, again, it is typically our methodology to say, unless you've got a really strong case to do something more stringent than 15% low income for rental, we're not suggesting you set that up as your standard, okay? On the other hand, if you're allowing an offsite production option for apartments, in that case, you can set whatever standard you want because it's an option. And so nobody has to do it. They can do the underlying foundational requirement of whatever it ends up being. I'm not saying 15% at low income always works. I'm just saying I wouldn't go more stringent than that. And in fact, spoiler alert, <laughs> I don't come to 15% on, the, on this analysis. But the other thing to think about, and we'll talk about this more, is that the state density bonus, which every year is amended in some way by the legislature, has made it easier and easier to use the state density bonus and the benefits provided by the state density bonus are getting stronger and stronger for the development community. And, and so what we find is when an inclusionary housing policy is adopted, it is often accompanied by developers then exercising their right to use the, the density bonus, the state density bonus, to mitigate the impact of the inclusionary housing requirement. So that's something to know, that's something to be aware of because it, it does typically come part and parcel. But also, then just the way the math works, and I always say this because the legislature doesn't do math, is it's much better to use the very low income requirement by density bonus than the low income requirement just because the math is so much stronger. Um, and so what you will typically see, even if you establish a low income requirement, you may see a number of developers choosing to do very low income because you have to, if, you, if, some, if a developer meets the more stringent of your requirements or the state density bonus requirements, you have to count that unit towards both requirements. So if somebody provides a very low income unit and you have a low income requirement, that very low income unit has to count towards the low income requirement. That's also a court case. That's the Napa case. So that's just something to keep in mind is that I think even though I'm going to recommend that you set your requirement at low income, I fully expect that you will see very low income units developed under the inclusionary housing program, but again, coupled largely with, with state density bonus. So what we were engaged to do and what we have done is we prepared a financial evaluation of projects, residential projects, to determine what the impacts are of an inclusionary housing policy and to try and set up requirements that will balance the interests of the unmet need for affordable housing against the interests of the development community. And so the first step in that process is to create residential prototypes. And those residential prototypes need to be projects that are projects that would be built in Thousand Oaks. And so what we do at the very beginning of the analysis is we work with the city staff, we work with the housing element, we work with, with planning documents to look at residential projects that have recently been proposed, developed, or being considered in the community. And we base our prototypes on those uses, those types of uses. So it's no specific project. Don't try and figure out what project it is when you look at the prototypes. It's an amalgamation of projects to get to good prototypes that represent the type of development you'd see in your community. So that's the first step. The second step is we run pro forma analyses on these prototypes to 100% market rate. So we run it to determine what sort of return could be anticipated if a developer was to build a market rate project. We know developers are building market rate projects. And so we know that whatever return falls out of that is the return they're accepting. So rather than saying, oh, you have to have this arbitrary threshold return or they won't develop, if they're in fact developing, then you, you get to this return and that's, that's what they're willing to do. And again, this is an analysis, so it's an analysis of prototypes, so there's some variation. But the key feature to understand is when you're looking at an impact, created by the imposition of an affordable housing requirement, the impact is the incremental difference in return at 100% market rate and then what the affordable rate would be. And so in every community I've worked in, the returns are different. 
the market rate returns are different, but it's still just that incremental analysis that we're interested in evaluating. And so we, based on that, we incrementally add in affordable units to where we're measuring against a couple thresholds. So over time, and, and I've been doing these for 30 years now, and this has evolved over time to, to meet you know, changes in market conditions, changes in affordable housing conditions, market, et cetera, is the two parameters that I look at is today, if an inclusionary housing policy was imposed, how much would the land cost have to be reduced in order to make no impact by that, by that requirement? And then the second test I do is today, how much more would market rate prices or rents need to be to overcome that, that requirement? Neither of these happen today. And that's important to understand. Neither of these things happen today. So there will be an impact of having an inclusionary housing program. And the, the magnitude of that impact will be very driven by market forces and just how much people want to be developing. But it's important to understand that you're allowed to have an impact. The legislature and the courts have told you you can have an impact. It just can't be confiscatory and it can't deprive an owner of a fair and reasonable return on investment. I'm going to say that a bunch of times. OK, so next one. So starting with the apartment prototypes, we ran three different types of prototypes. We ran one on a mall property and the zoning in place on the mall property. We ran one on neighborhood medium high zoning. And then we ran one on mixed use zoning. So to get the range of apartment type developments that we're expecting to see, that the housing element is expecting to see, the general plan had in mind, et cetera. And so I'll just go over them quickly. So the, the mall property, we had a density of 30 units the acre. And then we did market rent studies to, to look at the, the rents being achieved in Thousand Oaks for four star plus apartment projects. And for the mall property in that type of project that would be envisioned, the average unit size is about 890 feet, based on our survey. And then the development cost per unit are about $485,000. And the weighted average rent per unit is 31, basically $3,100. The stabilized return on investment, this is 100% affordable project, is 5%. What's important to understand about that is by being a stabilized return, it's a point in time return. It's one time when the project is fully stabilized and occupied. So the idea is, yes, you get 5% the first year, but then your income grows over time. And so if you were measuring this on a cash flow basis, it'd be significantly higher. But again, since we're just doing an incremental analysis, that's what shakes out. Meet neighborhood medium high, we started with a 20 unit per acre project. The units are larger. They're almost 1,100 feet. The development costs are $578,000. The rents are higher, so the rents are $36,17. Again, they're bigger units, so the rents are higher. And it generates the same return. Then in the mixed use project, we again have 30 units the acre, but bigger units than we had for the mall property. Costs are similar, they're $459,000. And the weighted average rent per unit is $35,66. And that is a slightly higher stabilized return. So what we're looking at, as I've, I've said, is we're looking to see what the difference is between the market rents and the affordable rents. So as you can see in this chart, the weighted average market rent, what we just went over, um, for the ones, twos, and three bedroom units range from $3,000 to 40, almost $4,200. The low income rents are set based on benchmark standards and set really, in this case, they're set based on what AB 1505 told you which is you can set it at 80% of median, and 30% of um, household income can be spent on rent. And so the low income rents range from 1794 to 2219. The very low income rents, what we used was the health and safety code section 50053, which is an old redevelopment standard, but it's also what the density bonus uses. And so it's important to understand with the, with the very low income rents is if somebody's doing very low income, they're also doing density bonus. And so you need to set the rents there. Um, so the very low income rent ranges from $1,102 to 1354 
So you can see the, the magnitude of the differences in the rents between the market rate and the low and very low. So the results are that the supportable inclusionary housing percentage, if you're assuming a low income requirement, ranges from 8% to 11%, depending on the prototype. And as you can see in the next two lines, those were the factors that I told you that I, that I weigh when I, when I come up with the percentages. And the idea is I don't want the property acquisition costs to reduce by more than 30%, and I don't want the market rents to have to increase by more than 5%. That has been evolving over time. Um, I did Pasadena in 2001, and that was the first time we actually looked at how long would it actually take for land values to catch up. And, and it looked like if you put a 30% requirement on it, or not requirement, but factor on it, that that, that worked out relatively quickly. Again, there will be an impact, and so that's important to understand. Um, if you switch it to the very low income, what you can see is the, the factors are the same. So the factors we're measuring against are the, the same, but because the rents are lower, then we end up with supportable um, inclusionary of 5% to 8%. State density bonus. So as I mentioned, state density bonus goes a long way towards mitigating the impacts of um, inclusionary housing policy. If a developer opts to use state density bonus, they must produce the units. They can't pay an in lieu fee. So you have, the, you have the impact of you're getting increased density, but you're getting the units. And so that's an important component of state density bonus. And so when we analyzed it for Thousand Oaks, we analyzed both the maximum density bonus that you can get which is 50% if you provide 15% very low income. But we also analyzed one that didn't take the whole density bonus, that provided um, a lower percentage of very low income and a smaller density bonus. The reason we did that is that actually happened in Thousand Oaks. So I think it was important to understand that not everyone will take the 50% density bonus. Not every site it can be efficiently developed with that magnitude of increase in density. You change parking type, you change construction type. Sometimes it outweighs, the costs outweigh the new benefits. So we ran, we ran three scenarios on that. So as you can see on this chart, the first two, the mall property and the neighborhood medium high, we did it both maximum. And then when we did the mixed use project, we did a 30% density bonus instead of a 50% density bonus. And what that generated was the 9% very low income requirement is what was necessary to get that density bonus, to qualify to get that density bonus. But when we did the math, when we did the, the pro forma analysis, it could actually support more. It could actually support the 9% low plus 7% low. And so it just gives you a picture of what could, what could be supported. It basically means that if somebody can use density bonus, they can fully mitigate the requirement, the inclusionary housing requirement. But, and this is an important caveat, not every property can efficiently use density bonus. And so I never set a standard assuming that all projects will use density bonus, and so I set, the pro I set my parameters based on somebody using base zoning. Then if they can come in and use density bonus, it will mitigate the impacts of the requirement that's been set and will be well within the bounds of what the law has told us to do. I don't think you have that strength of, of logic or, or rationale if you just assume everyone can use density bonus because they can't. So based on that, we came to the conclusion that we recommended for rentals, we recommended a 10% low income requirement. But again, if somebody uses density bonus, they could go, A, they will do very low income, very likely, and B, it's possible you'll get up to a 15% very low income production, or some, or some less, but I would say almost definitely very low income units. Okay, then the ownership one. We did two prototypes for ownership. We did a townhome prototype and we did detached single family homes. And the reason we did that is, I, well, two reasons, because it's happening, but also to show you the magnitude of the differences in terms of affordability gap between townhomes and detached single-family homes. And so as you can see here, 
the average unit size for the townhomes is a little less than 1,900 feet. The average size for the single family homes is a little over 3,100 feet. The price is more than double. So the price is 600, or I'm sorry, this is development costs. The development costs are almost double. There's $680,000 a unit for the townhomes, $1.4 million for the single family. Also, the prices are more than double at 784,000 and 1.5 million. The next slide we'll get to will show you the affordability gaps. So given those prices that I just gave you, the 784,000 and the 1,500,000, $1, is the moderate income price for three and four bedrooms, which are the townhome prototypes, range between 502,000 and 531,000. The moderate income prices for the detached single family homes are actually less, and they're actually less because of the costs associated with, with home ownership. And so the costs of home ownership for the detached single family homes are more than the cost of owning a townhome. And so when you factor in that somebody can only spend 35% of their income on all housing related expenses, the variable is mortgage. And so in that case, what you end up with is slightly lower prices for the affordable prices. And then the low income prices, we used 30% of income instead of 35% of income. And so then that gives a double whammy of it. So instead of being priced at 110% of area median income with 35% of income spent on housing, we use 70% of area median income with 30% spent on housing. And those are redevelopment. They're the it's section 50052.5 of the health and safety code gives you those calculations. And so that's what we used. So I like to use statutes. I like to use something that's a published calculation methodology. And so that's why we use that. But as you can see, the low income prices then are dramatically lower than the moderate income prices. So based on that, we came to the conclusion that a moderate income standard for townhomes could support a 10% inclusionary housing requirement. Whereas given the magnitude of the affordability gaps between detached single family homes and, and the moderate income price, they could, we could support a 5% requirement. And low income, then it's less, it's 5% or 3.5%. But we're not recommending a low income requirement. We're definitely recommending a moderate income requirement. And so, I said all that. I'm not gonna say it again. I just said it. Okay, so if we just go, oh, did I go the wrong way? Did, there we go. Okay, so in lieu fees. So the things to think about within lieu fees are how and when you're going to allow developers to pay a fee in lieu of producing the affordable units. And so I've given you a list of things that you might want to think about when you're making this consideration. And so one is what are your program goals? You know, do you want to, do you want to receive money so that you can give it to dedicated affordable housing projects that can receive outside leveraging with, with developers who that's what they do is build affordable housing projects? Or do you want to make sure that the units are provided on site within the market rate project? The other thing to think about, and I think this is probably the most important distinction of the list, is given the differences between ownership housing and apartment development and, and what it's like to own a unit versus rent a unit is do you want to think about allowing an in lieu fee for ownership and not allowing an uh, in lieu fee or making it difficult to use an in lieu fee for apartments and do you want to make it easy to use an in lieu fee for ownership units? Recognizing how large those affordability gaps are is do you want to get one unit where somebody won the lottery or do you want to be able to get 10 units with that same amount of affordability gap? So that's something to think about. Um, and it also telegraphs what my recommendation is. Um, the other thing is, so project size thresholds is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, small projects are impacted more significantly than large projects. And so do you want to create some kind of a sliding scale of, of in lieu fee requirements for those projects, again, so that you're not overburdening small projects? Uh, then this is another, well, they're all important, or I wouldn't have written them, um, is the community's view on density. So as I've said, it's very likely developers are going to want to use density bonus, but they have to produce the units. 
So if, if you want to get, as I mentioned, if you want to use in lieu fees to get money to do leveraged affordable housing projects, then you might want to think about the views on density. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, there's three ways to establish an in lieu fee. One is the affordability gap methodology, which is the, the primary methodology that's typically used, which is to say, if somebody produced the unit on site, the affordability gap would be X, so the fee is X. The second way is if you're trying to get folks to pay the in lieu fee, so if you're really trying to encourage it and you think they might not, is to discount the in lieu fee. I would say, though, that's not typically necessary because developers typically really like to pay the in lieu fee. And then the, the third one, and this is, I think, another one that will, will typically be used, is a schedule, a sliding scale schedule to reflect the needs of, of small projects. So it's really complicated to do the affordability gap analysis for the in lieu fee for, for rental. It's all these steps. Um, what we do, what the, the simple way to put this chart is to say we're trying to figure out what the affordability gap is, the effective affordability gap is of producing a low income rental unit. And so we go through this whole process where we compare the market rents, the affordable rents, then because the, the value of the affordable units is less than the value of the market rate units, we discount the property taxes, we figure out the annual affordability gap, we capitalize that at the market rate return, and we translate that into the in lieu fee. I'm happy to go through that in more depth if you want, but that's the, that's the methodology. So based on that, we just gave you one example. In the report, there are three examples. But just to show you how this works and to give it to you in a variety of different ways to make it understandable to different ways of thinking, but it all ends up the same way, is we used the mixed-use prototype, which was a large project. It was a 300-unit project. And we said, OK, we've recommended a 10% low-income requirement. So that would result in 30 inclusionary units. The weighted average unit size of those 30, of, of the 300 units is 1,042 square feet, and the affordability gap was $274,000. So if somebody was going to pay an in lieu fee for this project, you would take 30 inclusionary units times $274,000, and you'd come up with $8,220,000 as the in lieu fee for that project. That's just one way to look at it. And I think that's the, the most logical way to look at it. So you can see how all the math works. It's not the typical way to then apply it. But, but that, is the, that gives you that orientation. The, another way that it's sometimes done is to say, well, what's the in lieu fee per total unit in the project? So there's no affordable units in the project. So we're saying, OK, now we're going to put a fee on every single unit in that project. So if you accept that the affordability gap was $8,220,000, and you divide that by 300, then the total, in, the in lieu fee per total unit in the project, so all 300 units, pay $27,400, each one. And it comes to $8,220,000. The third way to look at it, and the way that I think is the most equitable way to assess an in lieu fee, is based on the size of the units, so the total leasable area of the project. And the reason I think that is because large units, if you do it per unit, large units get a break and small units pay more on a, on a pro rata basis. If you do it per square foot of leasable area, then it more equitably divide, um, allocates that fee. And so using that, we have a project that has 312,600 square feet of leasable area. That's 300 units times a, an average weighted average size of 1,042 square feet. We have the in lieu fee, which is $8,220,000. If you divide that by 312,600, the result is $26.30 per square foot of leasable area. So as you can see, the fee is always $8.2 million. It's just how you're doing the math. But, and, and just reiterating, I think the fairest way to do it is in lieu fee per square foot. So if you accepted that premise, you'd establish a fee that was $26.50 a foot, and that's what apartment projects would pay. So you only do this math once. 
You don't do it project by project. On the ownership project, we use the detached single family home prototype. And so as you can see in this one, the total units were 60 units, 60 units in the project. The inclusionary housing percentage was 5%. So that leaves you with three inclusionary units. The average size of those units was 3,100, 3,150 square feet. And the affordability gap per unit is $1.06 million approximately. This is my argument for an in lieu fee for ownership units. Do you give one person the benefit of a million dollars or do you take that million dollars and, and create more units with it? Um, but following that, so following that math through then, three inclusionary units at 1,057,000 is an in lieu fee of $3.17 million, $3 million. So then what we do for the total, the fee per unit in the project is take $3.17 million divided by 60, which gives you an in lieu fee per total unit in the project. So for 60 units, $52,860 a unit. Again, because I recommend using it per square foot of saleable area, the saleable area in this project is 188,850 square feet, which is 3,150 square feet times 60. If you divide that, if you divide 3.17 3 million by 188,850, the in lieu fee is 1680 per square foot of saleable area in the entire project. And that's the end of the math for this. So we had we provided you some options for other ways for the production requirement to be fulfilled. One is to, within, if you have a big development site, to parcelize it into two, two parcels, a market rate project, and then another part of the site where you do the inclusionary with rental units. The other option is just do it off-site, just completely off-site from the market rate project. And again, I think any time you're allowing it to be done off-site or even with the parcelization, my recommendation, even if it's an ownership project, is to have the inclusionary units be rental. Land dedication comes with a lot of responsibilities for the city. So you have to make sure the developer gave you a usable parcel that can feasibly be developed, that doesn't have hazardous waste, that doesn't have a gap in addition to what the free land would be. And so if you go that way, and when we have recommendations, we'll give you a whole list of things that you should look at. Acquisition and rehab of existing rental units, while a, a, an excellent policy, is not great for RENA. Well, it's not even feasible for RENA. So if you're trying to use your inclusionary units to help fulfill your RENA obligations, you cannot use acquisition rehab units. So I, I, it, given that I think most jurisdictions are using inclusionary to help with RENA, I do not suggest doing acquisition rehab. Okay. Do you want to do this? You want me to do this? I'll keep going. Okay. <laughs> Hope you're all still awake. Um, so what we're recommending is that the threshold size of the project be set at 10 units. That means, so for example, we suggested a 10% low income requirement for apartments. That would be one unit. So it's a full unit, so you're not dealing in fractions. Um, the covenant period, um, this is something that's been evolving recently. Typically, as I mentioned, most pro programs have a 55-year requirement, but a lot of jurisdictions have started talking about doing perpetual requirements. And so what this is is a hybrid of that, which is to say it needs to be affordable for at least 55 years, but if at some point in time it's no longer a residential use, then the covenant comes off. So if the characteristics of an area are no longer residential, you don't want to have this one residential project just sitting there in the middle of, of some other type of zone. So that's why the recommendation is greater of. And then um, for ownership housing development, the recommended covenant is one cumulative 45 year term. So the owner sells and resells it affordable for four, one 45 year term. So just reiterating the apartment development re recommendation is 10% low income. The townhome recommendation is 10% moderate income. Detached single family home recommendation is 5% moderate income. Um, the reason we came up with these is again because the courts haven't given us guidance on what these standards actually mean and so we wanna have a conservative approach and that these, these results really um, are based on the results of our pro forma analysis. 
Um, so, as I mentioned, we're recommending in lieu fees be based on the total square feet of, of leasable or saleable area because it more equitably distributes the, the cost. We think the apartment developer development fee should be $25.70 per square foot of leasable area. I think the townhome should be $14.60 per square foot of saleable area. And the detached single family home should be $16.80 per square foot of saleable area. I think our recommendation is, so if you have a fractional unit requirement, so say you had a requirement for 3.4 inclusionary units, that 0.4 units, the rec recommendation is to allow a developer to pay an in lieu fee for that 0.4 units, rather than being either required to provide one more inclusionary unit or 0.4 fewer inclusionary units. Um, apartment projects with 20 or fewer units, um, we're recommending that those be allowed to pay an in lieu fee by right, so a developer could choose to pay it just if they wanted to, and that the only time above 20 units that they could pay the fee is if they can demonstrate a situation of extreme economic hardship, and we actually have a fairly detailed definition of what extreme economic hardship is. And then our recommendation is that you allow ownership projects to pay the fee by right, irrespective of their size. So that any developer who wanted to pay a fee in lieu fee, rather than producing the ownership units, we're recommending that that be allowable. Um, so for the offsite production of inclusionary units, so for the other options, because again, you're, you're required to provide options, we are not recommending that apartment development be allowed to develop the affordable units offsite. We think they should be integrated into the market rate affordable market rate project. On the ownership, we think that they, if, if they haven't paid the fee, which we think they should be allowed to by right, that they should either be able to create the parcel that we discussed and provide apartment units, affordable apartment units on that, or offsite production of affordable units. Land dedication, I think that you should have the discretion but not the requirement to allow for land dedication to be used to fulfill the requirements and it should be subject to detailed, objectively stated requirements for you to accept any parcel that's being dedicated to you. And we're not recommending acquisition and rehab because you can't use it for RENA. So the whole purpose of this tonight from, from the inclusionary standpoint was we just wanted to give you the context under which our analysis was based so you'd understand the methodology and the approach that we've used. We're gonna ask you to provide us input on, on what you'd like to do based on what you've seen tonight. Um, nobody's voting on anything. Um, and then after that, we'll prepare a report that actually then identifies specific recommendations. Oh, it's gone, what happened? Okay, um, well now I don't know what it says though. There we go. Um, that we'll prepare a recommendations report um, that gives you case studies and examples of how it would work and what those standards would be. And then the next step would be an ordinance. And that's that. Thank you so much for the um, presentation. It gives us much to process, a lot to unpack and figure out direction. Maybe we can do it this evening, we'll see. Questions from council, Mr. Adam. You have that look in your eye. Where to start? That was a lot of information. Um, hmm. Okay. Let me get something clear about the, the apartments. Um, you're recommending 10% uh, for 10 units or more. However, you are giving the option for an in-lieu payment for 20 units or less, correct? correct? That's correct. Okay. And it's very likely that any, based on this requirement, that it's very likely they're gonna apply for a density bonus. Wouldn't that be true? You know, on a small project like that, not necessarily. So a project that's in that 20 unit, 10 to 20 units, you're then on a small site, and that brings up the situation where it's not necessarily physically efficient to use the density bonus because you have to do more intense parking. Yeah, yeah I see what you're saying. But it, and you're right, if it's 10 units, they're probably not going to apply. But if you're looking at an apartment project, 50, 60, 70 units, they're probably going to apply for a density bonus. That's correct. correct. Okay, that's what I would assume. 
Okay. Um, hmm. And this 10% number that you're recommending, I, I, I'm inferring then is you're saying that our community, based on the density rules that we already have in place and the height rules that we have in place, can't really sustain more than 10% without either severe diminishment of quality of the product uh, and or uh, more density and height than we actually allow. That's correct. Isn't that correct? Yes. So if we went beyond 10% to 15% or 20%, you're talking less quality because the, the project builders got to make money somehow, so they got to re reduce their quality, or you're talking even more density than a density bonus, and you're talking potential height beyond three, four stories, maybe even more, because again, you, you, this has to be financially feasible. Right, well now the way the density bonus works, so that if you have to make it physically possible for them to build the requisite number of units. So whatever number of units that is, so say, say it was a 20 unit project and they got a 50% density bonus, then they could build 30 units. Right, I understand, but <laughs> right. the 10% so that you suggested is based on those things that I just brought up. Well, right? they're really not because see, the 10% is based on somebody building it based zoning. So I'm saying somebody who just built it based zoning didn't do anything could support a 10% requirement. Now that doesn't mean they won't apply for density bonus, but I'm saying, because that's my whole point, is that I don't want a, a program where they have to use density bonus, but as a matter of full disclosure, I think they will. I get, but what I'm suggesting is at 15% or 20%, you're saying that's not gonna work based on the current ordinance we have in place for density and height. Correct. Okay, that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, hold on a minute here. <laughs> oh, and one other thing. Um, when you talk about building single family homes, we don't have, we're not, I, I personally don't think we're gonna see big tracks anymore like Dos Vientos with 1,500 homes. We're gonna see infill projects. Right. If that, 10 homes, 20 homes. So it would seem to me that the home builder is not likely to provide an affordable unit. No. It would be too much of a drag on their project. So they're almost, without question, going to pay the in-lieu fee, correct? Which is why we're recommending it. Right. They're going to, it's almost by right they're going to pay the in-lieu fee. No, that's what we're recommending. And you recommend, okay. And the, the benefit to the city for that is that if they decided to build the unit, we, we would get, just, on a small project, we get just one unit. And it'd be very expensive. And it'd be very, right. But... If they pay the fee, that could be collected by us and leveraged into instead of providing one unit for affordable, we could, you know, we could do like we did with Hillcrest, maybe down the road. We could buy you know, dozens of units, correct? We'd have leverage. You definitely have leverage, yes. All right. Okay. Well, that's it for now. I'm, you will come back with more, I'm sure. What I'm going to do is the I three. Might. You did very well. I'm gonna, we're going to do the three-question rule. Here, so for the take, sake of all the council members can ask questions and move forward, but your questions were excellent. Maybe it should be based on duration of presentation. I'm glad. should be a five question rule. I'm glad we have coffee. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Mr. Engler. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kathy, for the great presentation. Um, this is part two, and I enjoyed your first presentation, and I enjoyed this one as well. Thank you. Um, uh, there's an old saying, you're drinking from a fire hose. Well, I sipped a little bit from this one. Uh, there's a lot of information coming at us on this. Um, the, uh, just to let you know, I did read quite a bit of it on, let's see, on the uh, inclusionary housing financial evaluation attachment two. There's a typo on page 28. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I just want to let you know, you left an E off one of the base. Ah, thank phrases. you. No. Just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that in the next draft. <laughs> Thank you. Thank no, you. I always appreciate it, honestly. Um, I found a typo in my PowerPoint while I was talking, so. <laughs> See? Very good. Uh, quick question, um, attach a couple quick questions. 
You say you've been in, in the business for 30 years, and bless well, you for that. I've been in the business for 40 years. I've been in the affordable housing business for 30 years. Very good, and you've done 30 plus of these evaluations. I've done, yeah, this is my 30, well, I've done 35. You, according to some of what you've said tonight, and also in your documentation, you tend to, to be very um, conservative in your approach. Yes. Have you had any of those um, evaluations kicked back for any reason, any protests from the developers on it, or have they all gone through? Yeah, no, they all come to the public hearing to say why it won't work, but then we haven't had any problems past that. Good. And then um, in terms of... Uh, uh, there's some constraints we have to worry about, um, you know, constraint of development that HCD might be interested in. Um, we, what we also have return on investment and um, uh, confiscation uh, pr problems we have to try to avoid. Have you had that issue with any of the prior um, documentation that you've done, uh, prop plans you put out? No, that's a, that's a really good question. Actually, so in West Hollywood, which is a community we work in, but we didn't do their original inclusionary housing policy, um, HCD actually did come to them several years ago and say prove up that it's not confiscatory. And we actually did that analysis for Very HCD, good. and then they, they took that. Very good. And um, you mentioned a couple of your recommendations that you have a buy right for the um, uh, in lieu fees. Uh, is that an advantage one way or the other, uh, other than just streamlining things a little bit? Or should we as a council want to see any um, variation to an in lieu fee? Is that something we w want to take on? Well, this is absolutely a policy decision on your part on how you'd want to handle it. My, this is my professional recommendation. But you get to have any, you know, this is from financial perspective. And this is to get more bang for your buck perspective. But you can have other policy reasons to make other decisions. If I may, uh, just to be clear, though, you have to have an option, right? So. Oh yeah, yeah, right. sure. Okay, sure. No, I totally have a, have the option. Whether or not my my thought process is whether or not we should, as a body, review those, or whether by by right, as you mentioned and recommended, that that be uh, the way we go. So thank you. I think that's three. <laughs> You count very well, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Head, very much for your, for this presentation and the previous one. Thank um, you. As a preface, I should say, although I wasn't on the council at the time, I've, I've watched your earlier presentation several times and learned many new things each time, and I plan to do the same thing uh, with tonight's presentation, because I, I don't think I've fully absorbed yet all the information um, but I want to soak up as much as I can. Um, I want to, rather than getting into um, each of the details, um, maybe take a results-based approach to my questions and, and work backward from um, a few things I did not hear. Maybe I just missed them. Maybe they are here. But things, things that I would like to see as part of this, but I'm not sure presently there. Um, the first is I didn't see anything about percentages or proportions, maybe not hard percentages, of different sizes of units. And my concern here is that while we have increased the number of affordable units that we've produced in recent years, um, they tend to be heavily weighted towards studios mm -hmm. or, as one developer Aspirantly to call them junior studios. Oh no, <laughs> broom closets or something. Um, uh, that's not great for working families, um, uh, and that there is a great unmet need for affordable ha housing for those families. So my question is, what what could be done with the recommendations to tweak that, either to give fixed percentages or, or recommendations, but to steer the affordable requirements toward housing that families could, would be able to live in. So, so what our recommendation will be, and it's because as though there wasn't enough information in the presentation tonight, but so what the recommendation will be is on-site production will have to match the bedroom mix of the market rate project. Great, great. So if, if there are, if a project is heavy on one or two or three bedrooms, the affordable components would need to be in the same proportion. Correct. I see. Okay, very good. 
Um, the other interesting thing to me I heard tonight was it sounds as if you're saying the trend with covenant periods is going longer to extend the terms of covenant periods. And one of the things I've heard from uh, developers of condos and townhomes is that, especially in the moderate category, that, that it's a disincentive for them. That, that the fact that they're locked in for 55 years is a non-starter. They just won't build right. at that. Um, but, the, but hypothetically, at least what they've told me, is that they would consider a shorter period, so something like 20, 20 years or 25 right. years. Uh, what, what could we do? We, we have almost no new condo production here. Right. What, what could we do as part of this to incent that? Okay, so here's the policy issue associated with that, because there's definitely two sides of this coin. And at the end of the day, that's why I'm going to tell you I think an Enlufi is the, the better way to go is if you set it up so that it's affordable for just say 45 years, so each person who buys and sells, then what you have is a situation where the people who own that unit over those 45 years are essentially not building up equity. So what you've achieved with that goal is you've said, we've got this affordable unit for 45 years, which is a laudable goal. But each family who owns that house, they will accrue some equity in what they've paid off on their loan but then the affordable prices don't change that much over time. And so what'll happen, like for now, and I've predicted, predicted this for 10 years and I'm finally right, is the <laughs> generational low in interest rates are gonna go away. So now people who bought a unit, an affordable unit in 2014, and go to sell it now and they have to sell it at affordable, it's extremely likely the affordable price is less than what they paid for it in 2014. So. The idea of the irrevocable covenant over a 45-year term is, yes, you've got to keep a unit in your inventory all that time, but you're not creating wealth for your, your home buyers and you're not creating equity and move up ability for them. So now, oops, sorry. So now if we move it to the other side where you say, okay, like the density bonus, the state density bonus doesn't put any covenant period at all on ownership units. The first time it's sold, it can be sold at market. It's sold affordable price the first time. But, and this is the way a lot of inclusionary programs are set up also, is to say, let's just use an example where the affordable price is $300,000 and the market rate price is, well, let's just make it not so disproportionate. Say it's $500,000. So that $200,000 gap becomes an obligation that that homeowner owes to the city when they sell the unit at market and then whatever the proportionate share of the equity increase so they were they were to they were forty percent of the original purchase price. They get forty percent. The city gets forty percent of the appreciation. You won't have put any money in it, but you also then have lost the affordable unit. So your compensation for losing the unit is you get that that original affordability gap plus an equity appreciation share. Your homeowner now has is able to sell at a market rate price, albeit giving you some of the money back. And so they can move up and out, but you've lost the unit. So that's the trade-off. That is a wonderful segue to my final question. Excellent. Um, I'm an equity fan. Um, I would like to see as much equity options um, as we ha had in our last hearing um, at every income level. And bringing this to our, our city's specific arena numbers, our greatest need by far is in the low income group. It's not in moderate income. We're at 742% of target over the past eight years. It's not even in very low income where we're at like 36, 37%. It's low income is we're only at 3%. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, um, help me understand why we're taking away, uh, not, maybe not taking away, but not, not, in, not including um, ownership as an option for that group. Because um, the magnitude. Or, what, what, or let, me, let me phrase this Sorry. again in a results-based way. What can we do? Um, I think that's a good answer on the covenant period. What else can we do for that low-income group, which is our greatest unmet need, to incent ownership? The, and I will say, for an inclusionary program, right? So again, you're. I mean, the development community provide this for you. Is to sell to a low-income population, the affordability gap is so big 
that you're in a situation where the home buyer is paying $200,000 and the house costs $800,000. And so you've got a $600,000 affordability gap, which means that 75% of the price of that home has been gap. And so it's just, I mean, again, it's a policy decision on your part. I'm a financial person. I mean, to me, the magnitude of that gap is not warranted because then you've got one home buyer who won the lottery. And then the first time they sell, they're, they're up and out. So you've lost the unit. And, and instead, if you could have taken that money in a fee and provided low income units in a rental product, then you, you could have gotten se several more units than you get by doing it as a low income ownership unit. Now, the project before us, because that's, that's a land trust and that's, it's a self-help organization and that's what their business is, um, that's a laudable way to do ownership housing. Um, I just don't think it's the role of inclusionary. But that's just my opinion. Okay. I, I have a few more questions on that, but I'll, I'll yield. Thank you. Michelle, come back. Mr. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you. Uh, I appreciate anyone who's analytical. That's not my <laughs> skill set, so uh, thank you. My first question, how are we, or do you have guidance on how you're supposed to create a standard in a market that is not set? The real estate's cyclical, right? So how are we supposed to create a policy that doesn't give us flexibility on a per-project basis when we cannot hurt ROI and knowing there's times, like right now, very difficult to build. We have the debt market completely pulling back. Cap rates have not moved. To build anything right now is, you're seeing it all pull back now. You're seeing a lot of build stall. How do we, how are we supposed to create a policy knowing that there's gonna be future cycles and the fact that we can't hurt ROI? Right, so what I would say is, you're gonna to wanna to look back at this policy. So I like to set the policy on a conservative basis so that maybe you know, there's, there's some fluff that somebody's getting by the fact I didn't set it at a higher percentage, but I want it to be usable. But I'll, I'll use my Claremont example, which I always use. So if you've ever heard me talk before, you've heard this before. We cleverly did inclusionary in Claremont in 2007. The market immediately crashed. Nobody built anything. And so we had this policy that nobody was using, but nobody, it wasn't because of inclusionary, just nobody was using. But so as, the, as it started to, to calm down, as the impact started to calm down, we went in and we redid the policy. And we set up the policy in a way that was then usable for that market. So what I'm suggesting is that the recommendations that I'm making to you tonight and in this program, I think are doable when you have development. Right, so if you don't have development at all, then obviously you get zero units. But I don't think it's gonna be because of inclusionary that you don't get those units. So then if we find after a period of time, and some cities set it at three years, some people set it at five, is to say, or you just look at it and you say, oh my gosh, you know, either the market's gone crazy and we're not getting nearly as much affordable as we could have, or no, the market's really stagnant, now we think we're an impediment, right. is you come back and you change it. Right, so, uh, okay. On one thing you just mentioned, you don't think building will stall out because of a inclusion policy. It'll be more market driven. What we found on our end is if, if a project has to have a certain percentage of affordability that then impacts our return, right? Because in real estate, if you're developing, this is the greatest risk you can take on as an investor. Sure. So you have to have a return that's gonna meet the, the risk profile, right? right? If the percentage is too high and it now brings our return to a point where we're not comfortable taking on the risk. We as investors typically have two options. It's either try to drive market values higher than maybe what the market actually supports, or two, we wait and we let rents continue to grow until the point of the deal actually penciling, right? So I would say, at least from our experience, inclusion policies will pull developers back if deals just don't pencil. Uh, but that might just be a difference of opinion. On the sale side of residential, where I agree with you if the option is have one house where somebody gets to win the lotto, or two, a, a possibility of, of spreading out into multiple units with the in-lieu fee, if those aren't our only two options, 
really, I, I guess the question, I'll try to make this not a I'm speaking to you, but it formulate in a question. If on that end of the two examples, I think the in lieu fee and then build more is a better option, but wouldn't the, uh, let me ask you a question. Have you seen examples where it would actually make more sense to not have an in lieu fee, allow builders to build and, and maybe incentivize them to put more supply in our area where that is really, in my perspective, the need. But we are so below demand. When, when you're this far below demand, this is really when prices rise. So wouldn't that be the best example? And maybe just tell me through your experience Okay, so through my experience, and especially in a community like this, I think what overrides exactly what you said, which is all valid, is that magnitude of the gap. I just think it outweighs it. I just think the fact that there's a million dollar gap on a single family home. I just don't think it's good public policy to give that one million dollar gap to one person. I agree there. So, so I think that's, that's my, my justification on that. I think getting the in-lieu fee provides you that flexibility to go get units that are good quality units that then can be generated at a lower affordability level. So it's two birds with one stone. Uh, I guess I, I agree with what you're just saying. I guess my, my point is, if it's for sale, why even put an affordability aspect to it, knowing that we're talking about supply of ownership, which in theory, more supply actually softens pricing, not drives it out like we're, right. we're experiencing. So I'm gonna give you my stages of grief. Okay. Okay, I knew I was gonna be able to get this in at some point. I <laughs> so so you've, you've given me that segue. So what typically happens with an inclusionary housing policy is that Developers have already purchased land and are already, you know, well along the way, are going to get less profit than they wanted and less profit than they underwrote for, mm -hmm. right? So it's the risk, as you mentioned. Right. Then what happens is after that it's, or it's in the landscape and people know it's there, then what happens is developers say, I'm not going to pay as much money to buy this land because I can't support it. I can't get my yield, right? So then what you have is a situation, well, then there are property owners who are saying, well, I don't want to sell for less, so I'm going to hold. Right? So then enough time goes by where then you're in a situation where well, some owners start to pick up and go, God, I really want to sell, so I got to go. And market prices increase you know, over time. And so you see that in the landscape. And then ultimately, much like any kind of, even though it's not an exaction, because the courts told us it's not, but just like any other exaction, it doesn't raise the value of the house. right? So you can't necessarily get a higher price for it. But it is something that's there. It's, it's a public good. It's just like a park or you know, any of those things. And so it, it gets built into the landscape, and then it's just accepted, and then everything balances out. I did, um, this is now several years old, but I did a, 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 a graph of inclusionary in four different cities, 10 years before it started, 10 years after. And there was no discernible pattern before and after inclusionary about the production. It went up, it went down with economic cycles, but it did not seem to have any correlation to the inclusionary. So I just think that, again, because we've taken a conservative approach, I don't, I mean, this, I wouldn't suggest it to you if I thought it was gonna have the impact of, of being a constraint to development. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. My turn. My, my, my challenge here is that we are trying to provide a guideline mandated by the state that we provide affordable housing to low, very low income folks. And yet we have in lieu fees for any development that occurs. In lieu fees meaning per square foot as you discuss is one of the most amicable way of doing this. And it increases the cost to the renter or that home buyer who does not qualify for low or very low income. They're paying those in lieu fees when they make the purchase or rent that unit. Is that a correct statement? I, I think from a macroeconomic standpoint, it could be considered a correct statement. I think I will stand by in, a, in any given development. The developer is taking as much rent as he can get or as much sales price as he can get from the market, irrespective of what they paid to build it. But that is reflective onto the price of that apartment you're renting and or that home that you're buying when they charge $26 more a square foot, the person that's gonna pay for it is the renter and or the um, uh, home buyer because your assumption is, well, the 
developer's gonna charge whatever price they can. Correct. And what the market will bear. Right. But you're going to hit a point where it doesn't pencil out. We have had very little development in Thousand Oaks in the last 10 years. And this is without in lieu fees and without affordable housing being forced upon the, this community. We have green-lighted over 1,000 a, a plus units at the Kmart site, Baxter, and Lakes. We have one that's coming online that hopefully will come forth across the street from Amgen. And yet everything that you and Sacramento have put before us is making it unaffordable. The interest rates have gone up, so the debt service on the loan that they will have to do to develop it is going to price the units off the market where we can't afford them. And this is all without these in-lieu fees or these affordable housing uh, mandates and so forth. What makes you in Sacramento think that we can afford to do this? This is going to stifle development, reduce the number of units to address our housing needs here. This is lunacy. Okay, so first off, I'm taking no credit for your RENA number. Okay, so so don't say me and Sacramento Noted. as though Noted. we're somehow friends. Okay. You're navigating us through this, and I, 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 I understand. Yes. Okay, so having said that, I will say I think your argument is, is especially strong on the ownership side. I think it's not as strong on the rental side because I think what you have seen in your development in Thousand Oaks is folks are using the density bonus. And we have not developed the thousand plus units because it does not pencil out now with the debt service, higher interest rates, inflation. And you can't build a building that if you're gonna rent a one bedroom for $5,000, $6,000 a month at the current rate. And now we wanna throw in lieu fees for any future development and affordable units there that increases the fees for everyone else who's not low income in that building. Well, now what I'm suggesting is that the affordable units in that building gave that developer the right to build 50% more units. And it's the 50% more units that are bearing that price. So I'm not suggesting that they can pay it in Luffy. I'm suggesting they're producing the units. I, I understand that. But let me, let me just finish with my final question. So if we have 50 units, but 15 to 20%, let's say, are affordable, 10%, whatever. The question is for the people of Thousand Oaks, can we live then with the density bonus of 60 plus units and a six to seven story building? That's the question at hand here. Now we're losing the look and feel that makes Thousand Oaks so wonderful to live in is not having six and seven, eight story buildings with 60 plus units per acre. And this is what the density bonus that Sacramento is throwing upon us, giving the developer the ability to do so. Is that, is that a correct statement? I don't know that I'd go six, seven story buildings given the kind of densities that are allowed, but yes, that is correct. Thank you, that's my third question. Mr. Powers, you wanted to make yeah, a comment? Just, and, and this is for the benefit of the entire council because we're in an interesting time right now, right? Everyone knows that we have a general plan uh, right on the horizon, all right? So the reason to remind everyone, the reason why we're here, the reason we're having this conversation, we have a housing element. The housing element's in with the state. One of the programs that's required in that housing element is an inclusionary housing program. And because they recognize that by virtue of the modifications to the land use map, that as a reminder is the first time we've touched that in this capacity since 1970. So, so um, what, what we have seen and what we have um, witnessed over the last number of years and especially the last 18 months with the projects that have come through is the leveraging of development agreements. And these development agreements have been essentially, you know, not to use the same word, but in lieu of the, uh, of having an inclusionary program. Without that inclusionary program active and in place, that those negotiations happened on a project by project basis. That goes away in the post general plan era. And so what occurs then, rather than having those project by project discussions, is that that, that um, certainty is at least known on the front side for the developer. And I know Kathy talked about her stages of grief, and that's real, and, and we, we know that. But this will be a replacement from what the council has seen often in an ad hoc manner, which is agreements reached for, and some of those projects have leveraged density bonus, some have not. Um, so, uh, some of them have, have, have paid uh, essentially an in lieu uh, attached uh, uh, to it. So we've seen all the different forms and fashions uh, there. And this, this will materially sort of change what has been in the past to what will go forward. But it's very much in concert with the general plan. 
Thank you, Mr. Powers. Uh, we're going to go through the three question because you're up there, Mr. Adam. You're on. You got your three questions. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm glad Drew brought that up because we have had inclusionary housing, but it's been called developer agreements, basically. That's how we've been operating. And um, it, it, believe me, these developers don't come forward and say, you know, I'd like to build some affordable housing for you. It doesn't work that way. We have to insist that that happens, and, and it has happened, and it's been at about the rate of 10%. About 10% at the Kmart site, 10% at the 299 site, give or take, but it's been right around there. And with the developer agreements, we've also gotten all kinds of myriads of benefits based on quality and, and craftsmanship and made sure that these projects really fit with the quality that we're looking in, in the city of Thousand Oaks. And so now we're at the point where the development agreements would go away and be replaced with this inclusionary housing situation, where uh, this isn't a question, is it? <laughs> I'm kind of just discussing this with you. Uh, but it would be, give the, now the developers would be told that you, we don't have to bargain with you anymore. Here's, here's the situation. You know, here's a, what you're it's, facing. It's, it's a, a great statement, and love to discuss that with you at the time when we do that. So can we do a few more questions? Other, unless you have other questions you well, wish to I, ask. I was just thinking that I wanted to talk with you. I would love to talk with you when we hit that point, if that's okay. I, mm -hmm. I think we've had inclusionary housing all, all along. It's just been developer agreements is what it's been. But do Mr. I Powers, have any question. Um, well, just while you're contemplating that, I just want to quickly remind the council we do have um, the linkage fees piece of this. We oh, want it. We did not want to conflate the two items together. Linkage fees is brief, uh, but that piece needs to be out there as well. Recognizing you may have questions on that as well uh, before we get. I know we have a handful of public speakers yeah, let's here, so do I just that. want to make sure that there was an awareness that that was still there. Let's move on to Mr. Engler. Oh, I'll make my 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 question fairly short here, um, just to remind everybody, we do have an inclusionary housing uh, ordinance on the books right now. It's, it's, it's set at zero, and really what we're, we're looking at is uh, do we reestablish it at some, uh, at some figure? Um, and uh, it was originally set quite a bit higher than what we're proposing now, it looked like to me. Uh, and then to, to Mr. Taylor's concern, uh, the council came in and put it to zero when we had the downturn. So we have that flexibility. Um, the, the question is, um, do most developers, um, because developers have had to pay, or wrong word, have had to contribute to the, to the common good of the city over since the city, our city has been in place. Uh, I think of our open space, our, our parks, our fire stations, everything came from the developers of, of residential areas. Um, <clears throat> going forward with this inclusionary housing, most developers, in your opinion, would recoup any losses from, the, uh, from using the um, uh, density bonus, correct? On, the, on apartment projects, yes. On ap apartments, yeah. I do believe that. Yeah, I, I would think that that was where I think if, if we have an inclusionary, and as Councilman Adams pointed out, they're already using it through our um, development agreements. Okay. Um, I think we could expect more of that in the future. Is that what, uh, what I'm hearing from you and from others tonight? No, that's exactly what you're hearing, and it's, and it's the double-edged sword, is I think it will completely mitigate the impact, the financial impact of, in, of the inclusionary, but it will result in higher density, taller, larger projects. But, but the, the inclusionary housing sort of puts everyone on notice, this is our expectation. Correct. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, clarification and a question. The clarification is, I think you, I heard you say um, you'd done a study of four cities and found no discernible impact on the pace of overall development. Um, but, but within that, there, there was an increase in affordable housing production, was there not? Yes. OK, great. And then, and then coming back to the, um, that low income category, which I'm sorry to be a broken record, but it's, it, this is important. Um, this is our greatest unmet need by far. Um, what, what else? Besides what, what's here, just blue sky, what, what should we be doing to, to incent 
housing in that area, given that it is our greatest unmet need. Well, this is a policy decision for the council, but you'd have to put money into it. I'm sorry, we don't put money into it? You would have to put money into it. So you would have to you would have to assist a developer, just mm -hmm. like you just the item like the item before. Mm -hmm. You'd have to buy the property and then and then donate it to a developer of a, a self help type, not that actual self help, but you know, Habitat or the self help group, et cetera, to, to do that because that's their mission and that's what they do. And so you would be creating that opportunity, but the only way to do it is with money. <coughs> Going back to the the equity questions I, I had asked before, because I'm a fan of equity. Um, the, the covenant periods and the, ex, the very good explanation you gave about, about there being an equity bump from doing it that way, would that, would that have a, a stimulative effect on if people are moving out of that very low income category? Would, would they then be in a better position or would there then be more low-income housing produced? Is that your expectation? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. If I may, Mayor. So, to Mr. Newman, to your point, I, I think uh, one of the key um, points that Kathy made earlier was this: you heard the word balancing, right? And so we talked about, as Al Adam mentioned, C C Council Member Adam mentioned. Um, the development agreements that are, are going to be going away, it's like our attempt to do the inclusionary housing with that, right? So this is just one tool. And to your point, we work on trying to get them to build low income. But as Kathy mentioned, that you're going to have the situations where they're going to do the density bonus and probably, overall, probably do very low, and we have to allow that under the law um, to meet that requirement. And that density bonus then gives them options to have uh, uh, more units be built. So that's one option that you can have. And then if you have that loofy, of course, you can use that money for low income housing and have projects like we just talked about today. Um, or the other option, just to put it out there, is that you can actually increase the density because that would, again, do a different calculation by increasing the density like some other cities that we have in our county that have a different density number. And that's another way. Because again, our density, the reason why she's doing the calculation um, as a, an expert for us is because she's going to look at our factors, right? Our factors for our city. So if you change some of those factors, such as more density allowed per acre, for example, then that changes the equation and changes the options for developers who look at our city and say, okay, now it's a different, it's a different calculation, which again goes to Mr. Taylor's point too, right? It, those are how you play with it, right? But for today, for right now, what she's presenting is a conservative estimate to use as, as a tool to bring more affordable housing in our city. Thank you. Yes, the, the, the point, just to clarify, the, the reason I'm asking this question um, is, is not that we're not producing more affordable housing. We are, and I very much appreciate how intelligent and nuanced this effort is toward that. The point I'm making is, is a nuanced one, is, is that affordable housing is not all one thing. And within that, we're, we're talking about things that I've heard here that will definitely stimulate the very low income category, but may or may not stimulate the low income category where a need is greatest. That, that's the concern I was raising. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Real quick, just a clarification. I'm piggybacking off of Councilman Newman. Uh, you said there's no change in impact uh, on economics long term with the inclusionary policy, correct? Is that in California specific or is that nationally? Oh, I, this is just Southern California specific. Just okay. Southern California. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's been my experience in the 35 that I've done and watching what's happened is that it hasn't, in any of the policies I've worked on, it has not impeded development. Right, I guess the, the reason I was asking, if, just to clarify that it's California's, California real estate, yes, California's a special place. Is there, it, there's not a lot of places like it, but that's not the main, in my perspective, the main driver that outprices us, at least comparable to the nation. It's so difficult to build here. So really where I wanted the clarification is, how much is the, inclusionary plan a part of that and how much is it just 
difficult for us to put supply online a part of that equation. Um, second, you were mentioning, and I totally agree with you, if you're suppressing or, or you're bringing the margin or potential return down by limiting rents, uh, you gotta go after density, you gotta build more, just the economies of scale. For a place like Thousand Oaks, and, and this is, you know, as, as the, you know, there's three of us that just ran a campaign recently. Something that we heard, and I think ultimately what we're trying to balance is, one, there's an affordability issue. And two, there's a concern that kind of Thousand Oaks, which is, you know, a lot of ways special for us that it's not somewhere like the Valley. That's something we heard a lot. Don't make, you know, Thousand Oaks the Valley. When builders are incentivized to go large and ultimately find the cheapest possible way to do so, which in my perspective now we're looking at incentivizing big, ugly, gross buildings here. Uh, ha, ha, what would be your, your view on wh where that line is, where you, know, you, you are putting a restriction on rents, you're offering an in lieu fee, but you don't want to incentivize the in lieu fee to not offer, offer affordability, and are we just all in all putting ourselves in a position where we're getting worse product and or investors that don't want to invest here? And then are we just seeing the affordable is issue run out everywhere else? Well, right. Well, I mean, I think there is this whole key of the affordability issue and the difficulty of development. There's no question. And there are a number of communities where the difficulty to develop is not related to anything related to inclusionary. That's, that's absolutely correct. I think from a planning perspective in your city and your development standards in your city, you will control the quality of these projects. You won't control the size, but you will control the quality of them. And actually one of the nice things about inclusionary is that when you have inclusionary, you can establish development standards within the inclusionary housing program. Whereas if a, a developer just comes to your community and wants to do a density bonus project, you have basically nothing you can tell them. And so I do think that that is one of the almost unanticipated values of inclusionary is it does give you more discretion. Okay. And, and Mr. Taylor, I will say that uh, with, with the density bonus, just not even with inclusionary housing, but just a density bonus, you will see that we have objective standards now that we've adopted in the last year and a half. And, and those standards help us with um, controlling the look, controlling the architecture to some extent. Again, they have to be objective standards. We have adopted those, and so that helps us with that issue that you're concerned about. They can't just build a big block, uh, even with the density bonus. They have to meet our objective standards, and so, so that's important that we have those. <laughs> the reason I asked was not, uh, if, we're, if we're requiring, let's say, a project to look better, which is ultimately meaning more cost, right? What, what we're ultimately doing is bringing margin or return down. So. I hear what you're saying. I think what I'm trying to just wrap my head around is, at what point do people stop wanting to build here? Yeah, and, you know? and, and I, I think, I'm, I mean, I don't want to get in a debate with it, but I will counter with that fact that with the objective standards that we have, what we're doing is we're actually making them build uh, to a standard that helps them also sell, rent their units or sell their units, right? I mean, so many of these builders, they're not too upset, from my experience, in doing development agreements with them, and I've done a few now in the last couple of years. They, they're not really too big on some of the architectural features. They, yes, it's a cost, they throw that at us all the time, I agree with that, but at the end of the day, they also know that I need to have a product that's going to get people in here, right? And so they have that element to it, and so I think our objective standards help them in harmony with that to help them build, yes, to objective standards, but also something that's not gonna be so terrible that they're gonna say, I'm not gonna be able to rent these out anymore, especially at the rents that they would be requesting in our city. Mr. Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's talk about quality. That, that's a big issue for me. And uh, I mean, I look at our, I don't, you probably don't know our 299 project, but uh, it's extremely high quality. Um, amenities galore, water features, dog parks, uh, we work spaces, I mean, exactly what we wanted. And they came in at about 10% affordable. They were able to give us the quality and the affordable. So my question is, and I think this is self-evident, there's, a, there's a, a relationship between how much you ask for affordable versus the quality that you are gonna end up getting. 
And the higher you ask for, the more potential there is for diminishment in quality. Is that correct, isn't it? I, I might take it a step further. Oh. And I say that the higher you go in what you're asking for, the more you're actually just constraining development from happening. The more, say it again? You're constraining development from oh, happening right. at all. There you go, even beyond quality. Even beyond quality. You're starting to actually, um, well, I don't know if the right word is confiscatory, but you're, uh, you're starting to restrain the project completely. Right, and, and as, as the city attorney mentioned, I think the quality, and this goes back to a slide I had very early where the quality of the real estate really matters, because in some communities, just adding quality won't add to what the rents are. But in a community like Thousand Oaks, it does. I'm, I'm extremely concerned about quality. I, mean, I don't want to build army barracks here right. in the city of Thousand Oaks. Well, right. But because, and again, so to your point, with a 10% requirement, that means 90% of the people want, you know, are going to want premium quality. Yeah. And the 10% are too, yeah. but, you know, it's a matter of the 90% are going to be willing to spend significantly more yeah. money to get that quality because of the strength of your real estate market, which is a, a major factor in the analysis. Yeah. It seems to me here in our city the 10 percent's already kind of been tested because with the different projects we've approved, Kmart, 299, and a few others, we have been able to balance affordable with quality. Right. And I think the one other thing that I'd mentioned that, that hasn't come up is that because of your new general plan and because of sites that have effectively been created for residential, the fact is, is that those sites now are just worth more once that they're allowed to be residential than they were before. So instead of somebody making that much more value, if they have an inclusionary requirement, they're just making that much more value. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's almost, it's a community benefit type thing. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. this is actually the ideal time in that regard when you've created residential that didn't formerly exist is to also say, well, okay, we, ga we gave you $10, but we're taking two of them back. Mm -hmm. It's, it's all but you didn't balance. sell zoning, by the way. I yeah. never said that. It's a balance, that's for sure. Thank, thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. <laughs> Got an extra question. There, there's uh, some stakeholders in our community, such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Caneo, Moore Park, Simi Valley Re Board of Real Estate, uh, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association. Have you collaborated and chatted with them as to their input on this uh, recommendation? We did focus groups um, last fall, and Ian, you can... Uh, invitations were sent out. Uh, the chamber was present at the stakeholders meeting. Um, the Thousand Oaks Boulevard Association was not present, but uh, we did follow up with each of them individually as far as soliciting any comments, and, um, but we did not receive any. The real estate board, were they? Um, um, Mr. Luck? I would have to go back and double check. Uh, I mean, there were representatives from the real estate industry as well as actual the developers that have built some of the projects that have been talked about tonight. Okay. Um, so. And because again, I'm kind of surprised Toba wasn't present because they're very active and very interested in things of this nature, as well as the real estate board for Keneo, Simi, and uh, Moore Park. Uh, so I, I would question how much of an outreach occurred there. Uh, I, as if what I'm hearing from you, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, because, for example, if a developer wanted to build 10 houses that were $5 million each, instead of making that 10th house a low-income house that someone would win the lottery and, and have a wonderful house for pennies on the dollar, in lieu fees would be a better way to go. Is that your position on this, that for both rental and ownership, it's better to do the in lieu fees of paying per square foot? Um, well, per square foot, for sure, but just for ownership. I prefer um, apartments to be produced, the affordable apartments to be produced. Okay, so for ownership. So those 10 houses are for $5 million each, uh, and in lieu fee would be paid per square foot for the house, and again, that drives up the price of housing, which may actually make or break a project. Uh, the question that kind of rings through this entire discussion is we had control with our developer agreements as to the look and feel and the design and how much affordable we want to have in a certain project, which we did with Kmart and Baxter and uh, in lieu fees uh, with the Lakes Project and what we have coming on board across with Amgen, with the Latigo Group, I believe it is. Uh, 
this is sort of mandating now that we, we're coming out of the discussion that we're not really going to have much of a voice there because this has become more automatic because Sacramento is saying you've got to do this. Is, is there any hard and fast rule with Sacramento as to you've got to do a certain percent other than it's defensible? Uh, or, or is it just open to how we want to put this all together here on, on the city level? Before I'll let Kathy formulate, I think one important distinction, and she mentioned it earlier, and it's just an important reminder, is the reason that control existed is because the land designation was not residential. Right? So that was the, that's the leverage for the development agreement. Post general plan, that land designation will be changed comprehensively. And so at that point, any of that leverage is gone. So that's, that's the sort of discussion point around this. You don't even have the option so it's gone because of the uh, change in land designation that we have through the general plan. Is that what we're saying? Once the land changes that designation, they have the right to come in and submit for a project. In this case, most of these projects were commercial projects that are looking to come in and change to residential, which is in the council's sole purview. And, and as I'm looking at the in-lieu fees, this would be my third question, in-lieu fees, I'm wondering if it would be good to pool those together and then take it over to a Manny Mansions and allow them to do what they do best. That way, it's benefiting the community as, as a whole? That's exactly what I'm talking about. OK. Without naming a company. OK. Sorry, it's just a favor of mine. That's all. I understand. Very good. Any other questions? Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. I'm sorry. I know this is a lot of questions. I think this is my last one. It's why I'm here. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, this recommendation applies to our real estate market and our real estate market being strong. It, does it apply to our real estate market today or was there a kind of a future economic outlook of what the next, let's call it five or 10 years look like? And is that what today's recommendation is based off of? It's actually, it is based on today, although I understand the, the constraints that you're faced with today, so maybe it's based on six months from now. But, it, but it's based, I mean, I didn't go too doom and gloom where, you know, everything just stops, but I was conservative. So. Well, I guess the, the, you know, this is something that I, I think every investor wishes they had a crystal ball for, right? Of course. But at least something that we're wrestling with right now is at least the, the expectation was interest rates are going to climb, we're going to bring down inflation, we're going to, you know, target to land back at 2% as the Fed starts to kind of, you know, mid-2024 bring it down. There's at least what we're seeing, a possibility where inflation is, is much more sticky than we realize. And instead of it coming back to 2, it might sit at 3, mm -hmm. potentially 4 for a little bit, which in our outlook, the market hasn't priced in, which is probably going to mean this real estate market is going to look very different than it does right now. I'm not saying that's the outcome. I think there's a lot of examples where it can go both ways. But with that being a possibility, are we maybe not taking as conservative of an approach because it's based on today's market and not what the potential can be in two years? But what I, well, if, if I understand your question correctly, I think what is really important, and we've been talking about it for the last few minutes, is the fact that the city is creating this value and you're creating it now, right? You're not create. You're creating it with your general plan. Once your general plan is in place, then the land values are going to adjust to the fact of that greater opportunity. So if you don't have inclusionary in your landscape when that happens, then we're looking at a completely different analysis because now we're looking at a, a greater impact because now land values have gone up. And so the idea is is to build this in at the same time. So that again, using my example, we increased your land value by $10, but we're taking two of it back in the form of affordability. If you don't do it with the general plan, then you've lost that opportunity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Adam, any questions? No, we've got, no, we've got questions over here. I just wanted to, we can take five, we'll have a recess for five minutes and Come back after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All righty. Let's get underway again. We have a question by, here's, here's the game plan. We have a question by a couple, a couple council members. 
Then we're gonna to go to the second half of the presentation, which I've been promised it's short. Not me. Not you. And then we'll come back to public comment. So Mr. Newman, you're on. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, there was some mention just before the break of stakeholders, and much of our discussion tonight has been around the, it's been pretty technical around financial requirements for the real estate industry. I wonder if a different group of stakeholders has been consulted in this, um, namely the customers, um, the residents. Um, have any renters groups or homeowners groups or the general public been consulted Everybody. as part of the, this discussion? The, the meetings were open to the general public, um, but specifically uh, we had two different stakeholders group, one from the development community, which both discussed the inclusionary and the linkage fee, and then we also had a group for housing advocacy groups primarily. So, um, and that reached out to the variety of nonprofit housing developers in the community, as well as some of the other groups that um, speak in front of the council on housing issues as well. And those groups did provide input into the, into the proposal before us tonight? Um, I mean, this was a meeting at the very beginning explaining at uh, the onset of what inclusionary and linkage was. Yeah, but this is part of the, yeah, the stakeholders. Thank you. Input. Any other questions? Any other questions over here? Well, then we'll move on to the second half of the presentation. Thank you. All righty. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Tim Bretz. I'm a senior principal in the Los Angeles office of Kaiser Marston. I promise this will be much shorter, and if you want to reflect that in the question period afterwards, that's fine too. <laughs> um, I'm going to pull up the presentation now. All right, so I'm gonna discuss non-residential development linkage fees. And so for this presentation, we're gonna discuss uh, the Nexus study and then a financial feasibility analysis. And so first, what is a non-residential development linkage fee? It's an impact fee that is charged to new non-residential development being constructed within the city. The purpose of the non-residential development linkage fee is to mitigate the need for affordable housing that is created by newly constructed non-residential development. Now just some historical context from the city's perspective, the city originally enacted a non-residential development linkage fee in 2008. However, due to the economic uncertainties revolving around the Great Recession, the city council reduced all the development linkage fees to $0 in 2009. The elimination of these linkage fees was extended annually until 2014, and then in 2014, the City Council set the linkage fee amounts at zero dollars indefinitely. Now, we are engaged by the City to reevaluate the possible implementation of a non-residential development linkage fee based on current economic and real estate cycles. So, in order to de impose a non-residential development linkage fee, KMA conducted two studies. The first of which is a nexus study, which is required by the California Mitigation Fee Act. The second is a financial feasibility analysis, which was used to assess potential linkage fee amounts on prototypical non-residential projects that may be developed within Thousand Oaks in the near future. So here's just a general graphic of how non-residential development linkage fees work. The fees are charged to new non-residential development. Those developers will, will pay the, the fees to the city. The city will deposit that fee revenue into an affordable housing trust fund that's controlled by the city. And then the city would use those dollars to leverage, finan to leverage affordable housing to leverage the financing of affordable housing projects within the city. So 
So as mentioned previously, an affordable housing nexus study is required to be conducted prior to implementing development impact fees. In this case, the non-residential development linkage fee. Specifically, an affordable housing nexus study is used to quantify the need for affordable housing generated by new non-residential development. The nexus study establishes the maximum legally supportable impact fee that can be charged on new development. The nexus study that we completed complies with the requirements of the Mitigation Fee Act. The linkage fees resulting from this nexus study and ultimately charged to new projects are expressed on a per square foot of building area basis. So Kaiser Marston has been at the forefront of preparing affordable housing nexus studies in support of the imposition of non-residential development linkage fees. A general overview of the nexus study method methodology is, is shown on the screen. You know, the basic concept is that new non-residential development generates new jobs within the city. These new jobs are filled by workers, and some of these jobs are low paying, which results in the workers and their associated households earning household incomes that can be considered extremely low, very low, low, and moderate income. And so these affordable worker households created by this new non-residential development justify the need for new affordable housing to be developed. So the non-residential nexus study is based on current economic and real estate dynamics. Since the nexus study links the new jobs generated by non-residential development to the need for affordable housing, KMA often refers to these studies as jobs housing nexus models. For the purposes of this study, KMA reviewed recent entitlement information from city staff, as well as discussed potential non-residential development that may occur in the near future in the city. KMA and city staff determined that five land uses would be analyzed in the nexus study. Retail, commercial, office, industrial, research and development, and hotel lodging uses. And these are the same land uses that were analyzed in the 2008 Nexus study. So the Nexus study re is required to be completed per the Mitigation Fee Act. And I'm just gonna note again that the Nexus study results in the maximum legally supportable non-residential development linkage fees. And so these maximum legally supportable fees range from a low of $60 for industrial art research and development and hotel and lodging uses up to approximately $160 a square foot for retail, office, retail and commercial and office uses. However, these are not recommended fee levels. So to arrive at recommended linkage fee amounts, KMA conducted separate financial feasibility analyses. The financial feasibility analyses are based on pro forma analysis of prototypical non-residential projects that are currently being developed or likely to be developed in the near future. To design the prototype projects, KMA analyzed entitlement information for non-residential projects that have been submitted to the city for approval within the last several years. KMA also discussed with city staff projects with, that were considering submitting entitlement applications within the near future. However, it's just a, a, an important point to make is that based on the information provided, there's been limited amount of non-residential development within the city in recent years. The majority of this non-residential development has occurred in the industrial and warehouse sectors. So for each pro forma analysis, KMA relied on our experience with similar non-residential projects in the immediate region, as well as the greater Southern California area. We used cost estimates for similarly proposed projects. We conducted a market survey to estimate land prices and lease rates. We reviewed appraisals, as well as pro forma submitted by other developers for similar projects to estimate typical return requirements. And we also review market research reports 
to establish pertinent assumptions in our analyses. And these pro forma analyses are used to conduct two primary tests for establishing recommended linkage fee amounts. And again, the goal of the financial feasibility tests is to avoid placing an onerous burden on non-residential development. So the first test to calculate linkage fee amounts is to set it based on a percentage of total development costs. So KMA applied percentages ranging from 1% to 5% of total development costs. The resulting linkage fees would range from a low of approximately a dollar per square foot for industrial and research and development uses up to over $20 a square foot for retail, commercial, and office uses. The second test is to determine how the imposition of linkage fee amounts affects the financial return of prototypical projects. And so to conduct this test, KMA first analyzes a base pro forma analysis. This base scenario does not include any linkage fee. And this establishes a base uh, threshold return to determine which projects are feasible versus infeasible. And so I just want to look at this, the, the first row across with the no non-residential fee. You know, the green cells highlight what we determined to be a financially feasible scenario, and the red cells highlight what we determined to be financially infeasible scenarios. And so based on our analysis, even without the imposition of a linkage fee, the only scenario in land use that's financially feasible is the industrial land use prototype. And this actually aligns with the real world entitlement information that we, see, that we received from the city where the majority of projects that are submitting for entitlements are industrial and warehouse projects. And so the second step of this analysis is to sequentially apply non-residential linkage fees to see how those impacted the returns. And so as shown in this table, we we analyze fees from a dollar square foot to $3 to $5. And these fee amounts actually have a very minimal impact on the return results of the performance that we analyze. And so even at a $5 per square foot fee, we, we estimate that the industrial land uses would still be financially feasible at that amount. Again, the other land uses are not financially feasible even without the impact the imposition of any linkage fee, and if you added a, a linkage fee, the effect on the financial feasibility is very, very minimal. So the next step to setting recommended fee amounts is to look at linkage fees in surrounding jurisdictions. And so we completed a study of linkage fees throughout the Southern California region. To date, there are eight cities in Southern California that have non-residential development linkage fees. Five of these cities, were act the linkage fees were enacted within the last five years. And they range from a low of approximately a dollar per square foot in San Diego up to over $10 a square foot in Santa Monica. Based on this survey, if the city were to move forward with a non-residential development linkage fee, we recommend looking at the cities of Culver City, Los Angeles, Glendale, and Rancho Cucamonga for perspective on what range of amounts to set a linkage fee at. And so finally, this last slide summarizes the maximum recommended non-residential development linkage fees. The first row are the results of the Nexus study. And again, these are the maximum legally supportable linkage fees that we are not recommending the city impose. The next row down are the KMA recommended non-residential development linkage fees. And we express these in ranges, so from $0 to $5 a square foot for each of the land uses. Furthermore, staff is recommending that the non-residential development linkage fees be set at five, between zero and five dollars for industrial, and then no linkage fee charged to retail, commercial, office, research and development, and hotel lodging land uses. And I promised I would be short, so <laughs> that is the end. Thank you for uh, holding to your promise. We appreciate it. Any uh, questions from council? Mr. Taylor. 
Yes, go first, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two questions. The first one actually might just be a clarification on my end. Through the study, you mentioned that this is justified because some employers pay employees a low wage, and then because of that justification, the only asset class that can hold this type of fee is industrial. That's correct? The, the, the only asset class that we can implement this fee on and it doesn't compromise return too much is industrial. Uh, yes, I think, I think it's two separate tests. So the, the Nexus study generates or generates the need for affordable housing or justifies imposing a linkage fee. The financial feasibility analysis is where we get to the recommended fee amount. And in that analysis, industrial warehouse uses are the only financially viable land use that we studied. Okay, okay. So then my actual question is, why would a business want to want to start here if there's fees associated here and not in other cities? So now we're going to move from my analytical part to you know, this is really the policy question for the council to decide. You know, we we gave ranges between zero dollars and five dollars a square foot with the context that there has been an idea of a linkage fee in Thousand Oaks since 2008. Um, I, I think it, you know we did hold stakeholder meetings. You know the business community was not in support of imposing a linkage fee, but ultimately this is completely a policy decision. Okay. Thank you. I hope I didn't come off just you know. No, no, nope, yeah. I got cool. it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Powers. And just to add a further point to it, you know this is really at the heart of uh, public policy. This is big public policy decision making here, right? So. Um, when you embark upon a, um, a study like this, um, you you have to look at the full range and spectrum, right? And so that's why linkage fees are a part of that spectrum, and they have been uh, part, even though they've been set to zero, they've been part of the, uh, the historical um, history here. Now, the council, from a policy perspective, you're not just looking at the, the fee as it's attached to this. You're looking at the whole spectrum of economic development. And so when you're doing that, you're having to weigh, and that's why the staff recommendation is between zero and five. Right? Five can't go above five. Um, uh, but you have to weigh your economic development priorities um, with your housing priorities with your land use priorities, with all these other things overlaid on top of each other. And so that's that's really why the range was provided uh, to you. The other ones are not even economically feasible. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is a lot of that asset class is not even being built uh, here much because it was built heavily years ago. Mr. Brett's question for you. Your, your foundation premise on this is that jobs are created here with industry and there are some that are be low paying jobs. Therefore, we as a city policymaker must provide homes or places for them to live in our city. And my challenge with that statement, the foundation of it, is that there's three things that determine what a person is paid in the marketplace. One is how difficult is it to learn that skill? For example, a brain surgeon goes through a lot of training, whereas to give someone a broom and tell them to sweep the sidewalk doesn't take much training. So obviously the brain surgeon is more valued. Second, if you look at the number of people who can do that, not many people can be a brain surgeon, but a lot of people can be a street sweeper. So by the law of supply and demand, a lot of people who are street sweepers will be paid a low wage. And then you have to look at market demand. How much of a market demand is there for someone to sweep the sidewalks versus someone to do brain surgery? So my challenge is, and this has been put out there in public policy, it's out there in the media, people talk about it, that we should be providing homes for people that make minimum wage. No one ever provided me a home as a low-income person when I was going through school. You live where you can and afford to be, and you find the job and travel to that job to do it. And as your skill level goes up, market demand goes up, you get paid more for your service. So I disagree heavily with your premise, and that's what Sacramento has been putting out there. 
It also, by providing low-income housing, and here's my question for you, by providing low-income housing, it locks people into being low-income forever. Because if you have to make under a certain dollar amount, and I'm gonna use 90,000 combined income, that disincentivizes the person from getting a pay raise, getting an education to get a better training, taking overtime, because when they do that, and it puts them over the limit, they lose forty, fifty thousand dollars in housing subsidies. So if you get a ten thousand dollar bonus or a new job that pays you twenty thousand dollars more, it's better to stay at a certain income level and not become more. How do you answer that with this low income demand that's being put out through Sacramento to our cities? How do you answer that because we're creating a class of low-income folks that will remain there and not become more because it's incentivized to stay low-income. And you have a smaller and smaller and shrinking population of those that can afford to pay these linkage fees. How do we, how do we address that as a council and from a policy standpoint? So I'm gonna take a step back a little bit. You know, the linkage fee is meant to be sort of one tool in your toolkit for affordable housing. You know, we just talked about inclusionary housing. We're talking about linkage fees right now. If the city's goal is to produce more affordable housing and they want more tools to do this, the linkage fee is one way to do that. And I mean, you could go either way if you want it or not. That's just the concept. To your point about, you know, economic mobility, you know, often, you know, I work with a lot of tax credit projects that actually have multiple income designations. And so if people, let, let's say they go into the affordable housing project as an extremely low income household. If they end up making over extremely low income up into the very low income or even the low income categories, they can move up and stay within that project. And then the next unit that becomes available would be re-rented to that first extremely low income designation. So you wouldn't technically get kicked out until you're you know, way above low income. That's my point. It keeps them from getting out of that low income level and going into, you're no longer subsidized. And so the, the, again, this, this may be a policy decision of, you know, if, if, you're, if you're not low, if a person is, is a household is not low income, I mean, do they belong in a unit that's reserved for low income people? I don't, I don't necessarily think that any, anyone's not accepting a, a, a pay raise or a, you know, a bonus so that they can stay within a very low income range or a, a low income range. I haven't seen that in practice. And I don't know how intimate you are with the person, people that you service, but I can tell you from the people I talk to in the low income range as I work in the free clinics and in my practice, it's a reality. But that said, I'm gonna hold off on any more questions at this point, I will have some later on. Let me ask my other council members if they, if they have any other questions. And Mayor, if I may, just really quick, just to make sure we set the table correctly for tonight. Um, what the consultants and staff have done with this is we've responded to council's request to bring information back. And as we, we've, I think you heard a number of times now, the various tools that we have to address housing, to address affordable housing, this is one of those tools. It's very important that when the consultants go out there, they create the foundation to have a legal basis to allow some type of fee, if, we're, if you're gonna go that step, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that they had to do is say, for any type of mitigation fee, you have to lay a foundation, you have to show the nexus, and that's their first step that they did. And that's why it's important to make sure that you understand that they went out to do exactly that. We can't just create uh, a number, we have to do the study and uh, demonstrate that there is some nexus so we can defend it if we get attacked for it. The second part, as he, he mentioned, is again, going back to the tool, this is uh, one method that the state authorizes the city to do to require uh, employers help with developing housing for employees that are gonna be coming to a city or that are gonna be in the city. And so again, this is just one possible tool that we can use. And that's why when we do that analysis now, we realize, okay, with this analysis, we look at the mitigation study, we have that part, we can defend that, 
Now the second part, the policy part. Okay, now that we have that, what do we want to do here? It doesn't really, when you look at all the different options or all the different, the five different categories, the one that we say, okay, this is possible that it's not going to, it's, 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 it's feasible that they can do this and still create that, uh, uh, that industrial building uh, for, that, for those jobs. It is feasible with the industrial section. The other ones doesn't seem like it's feasible. So that's what's being presented to you. Um, I, again, I just want to make sure we clarify that because it is important that we ha had two parts here and, and it's important that you realize that we needed to establish that mitigation fee. The next is that we can do it. And then, okay, now the decision is, do you want to do it, right? I, I appreciate your explanation there and I agree with what you're saying. My comment though in the question to you was that uh, the foundation upon which we are saying that we need to provide this is flawed and that if you have minimum wage workers and you don't have enough of them, the wages rise because that's what they have to do as an employer to attract them. So by doing this, we're keeping wages low. That's my point that we were going here. So with that, let me uh, pass it over to Mr. Engler. You had some questions? No, I was just gonna suggest if there's no more questions, we could get uh, to our uh, Let me check with everyone. Mr. Newman, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Adam? Okay, so let's move on to public comments. Um, we have, what, six people, I believe, a couple on Zoom and a few in person. So let's move to Jackson Piper. And um, you have three minutes, Mr. Piper. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Jackson Piper. I'm from Unincorporated Newbury Park. Um, I'm also a co-lead of Ventura County EMB, a housing activist group, and part of the Thousand Oaks Livability Action Network, uh, more homegrown, um, you know, in the Caneo Valley uh, group trying to, trying to improve the quality of life here. Um, I'm happy that there's an inclusionary housing ordinance uh, update on the books right now, and I wanna see this be as refined as possible to produce as much affordable housing as possible in the city, uh, while still maintaining the ability of uh, developers to build here. Um, I think it's important to note that, you know, the economy today um, is not fixed forever. It, it will change over time. And whether this is a, a negative or a positive, it's going to change over the uh, following years. So I think it may be a concern of mine. It, it may be um, a bad move to simply set the um, inclusionary percentage in stone without taking into account the economy can change and uh, the inclusionary percentage and, and feasibility of building that affordable housing may need to change with it. Um, I would like to see Thousand Oaks at least match what Ventura proposed and, and uh, voted on last night, which was 15% uh, rental, 10% um, at the very low income, and then 5% low income combined. Um, and uh, for sale was 15% low income and uh, a choice of that or 20% moderate up to the developer. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way that uh, flexibility can be built into uh, to this process where all the different variables, you know, you have a developer that maybe is willing to provide more uh, low income units than the required percent, but for a shorter period of time, uh, for their their covenant, um, is there a way we can develop um, a series of options for developers to choose from that will make building feasible and then also promote more affordability, uh, more numbers of affordable units to be built? Um, I think the leakage fee, as you've just seen, is a is a good idea for industrial. Fifteen um, seconds. And maybe economic situations will change where the others will be more feasible, but I do think you know everyone should contribute that owns property in the city to uh, helping lift up the people that can't lift themselves up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Piper. Next up, and by the way, I just let everyone know I will give you a 15 second warning that, uh, towards the end. You have three minutes. Next up on Zoom, we have Rosanna Guerrera. Rosanna? 
Good evening, Mayor McNamee and City Council members. My name is Rosanna Guerra, and I'm a 30-year resident of the City of Thousand Oaks. I come before City Council, I've come before City Council many times to discuss, highlight, bring attention to older adults in our community. My plea is when City Council reviews policies to remember how decisions impact the older adult population in Thousand Oaks. My frustration is that even though our population is growing older, City Council and City staff do not take this growing population into account when, populate, when policies are brought before you. I've talked before you about how older adults are the fastest growing population to become homeless. You only need to remember what is happening at our mobile home parks and how the rise in CPI has neg negatively impacted that community. My remarks are to remind you that this population needs to be taken into consideration when looking at the inclusionary housing ordinance. While some affordable housing projects are planned, it will not be enough to meet the demands. That is why I'm asking City Council to review the percentage recommended and ask for more than the 10% on new developments. I thank you for your time and the consideration to place the issues of older adults in the policy making process. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next up on Zoom, we have Stephanie Sullivan. Stephanie, you're on. Stephanie, are you with us? All righty, so we'll move on to the next. Apologies. Apologies, my, my Zoom was giving me issues, but yes, give I'm us, here. Thank give you. us, Stephanie, give us a moment. Let's set your three minutes so you have the full time there. Give us a sure. moment. Okay, go ahead and begin, please. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Sullivan. I am a employee at Lutheran Social Services in Thousand Oaks. I am also a resident of the city of Thousand Oaks and have been here for nearly 20 years. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of my organization, but also as a resident and a concerned citizen. Um, I really appreciated the thorough overview from the consultant tonight of the inclusionary fees and the linkage fees. And I would like to echo what um, the two speakers have said before me about having a slightly higher um, inclusionary fee. I think it is critical considering the number of residents in our community who are low income and very low income and the number of um, people experiencing homelessness. I would like to add that this is not just adults who are working and trying to find a job that can meet those affordable costs, but they often have children. Um, they are often in our school district and they are trying to survive and I work with them on a regular basis. So this is not just impacting adults who are of working age, um, but as a previous speaker mentioned, it's affecting seniors and young kids. And so finding affordable ways to um, house people is really critical because it really does impact our entire community. There are um, very limited spaces for building set aside affordable housing as we've discussed and as the city council is well aware. And so I think that the inclusionary um, <clears throat> costs are very critical um, so that we can spread out affordable units throughout the city. And I would really encourage the city council to consider that um, when they're making this decision and go slightly above, if not um, higher than the conservative estimates that are recommended since this is something that will impact not only our businesses, but also um, our you know, residents, our citizens in this city. And they are in need um, desperately. And I speak from experience with having to field calls on a daily basis from people in the city. As far as the linkage fees, again, I want to reiterate that if you own property in the city, I do believe that there should be a, um, you know, a fee that goes along that to help lift up the community. And I say that as somebody who is a homeowner and who is willing to support that myself, because I feel like we are only as good as the rest of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Next up, we have Willie Lupka. Is Willie here in the audience? Willie, come on up. And after that, we'll have Danielle, who's 
waiting in the wings. And after Danielle, we have Rick Schroeder. Mr. Lupka. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and City Council and City Staff. Um, my name is Willie Lupka. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks. I'm a small business owner and a part of a nonprofit organization called Buen Vecino. We are partnering with a bunch of other local nonprofits to host a community education event on affordable housing on Wednesday, March 29th. All of you will be invited. I hope you can join us. I want to also let you know about a workshop I went to on Sunday that was hosted by a local church and featured the leader of an organization in Pasadena who partners with cities and faith communities to develop affordable housing on the properties of faith, faith communities. Some churches, synagogues, and other religious institutions have land and have a mission to serve God and humanity. And they've successfully launched a bunch of projects where affordable housing is built out in communities on open land that is owned by religious institutions. I think that's something we should look at here because the available land to build affordable housing on is so limited. This could be a way to serve the mission of the faith communities and help our community. I'm here to speak to the inclusionary housing uh, program and thank you for pursuing it. You're ahead of some other cities nearby that aren't, so uh, kudos for that. And for all of the work you've been doing and continue to do to provide affordable housing and address this critical need in our community. I'm the father of two kids in, in their 20s. Their experience right now is very different than mine was. When I entered adulthood, my peers and I moved out of our parents' homes after high school and either rented an apartment or went to a dorm and then eventually started families, bought homes, pursued careers. I don't know how many people you know, but a lot of people I know have their 20-year-olds still living with them. They haven't moved out like we did. Why? Because they can't afford a place to live. And what's happening with so many of them is they're leaving the community. I'm very concerned that our community is getting older and that young families who we want to settle here and thrive and bring their kids into our schools can't afford to live here. I strongly support the inclusionary housing ordinance, and regardless of what anyone says, I believe you are doing it, not because anyone is forcing you to, but because you love our community, and you know this is best for the future of a strong community, and you know that you serve everyone in this community, not just certain interests or, or businesses. 15 seconds. The entire community will benefit from this and be stronger and have a better future. Please push beyond the 10% as much as you can. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lupka. Next up, we have Danielle Borgia, CEO of Caneo Chamber of Commerce. Good evening, Mayor McNamee and council members. I'm Danielle Borgia, also resident of Thousand Oaks in addition to president of the chamber. I'll start with the, the easier topic from the chamber side. Um, in regards to the non-residential linkage fees, we really think it's unfair that the industrial is being um, singled out in this category. I think we really need to keep the linkage fees to zero across the board. We are, we are working so hard as a city to reinvent um, the industrial area in Rancho Canejo, and I think we need to support that economic development and not um, provide additional fees for those types of industrial uses. On the residential side, I think you know we've talked a lot tonight, tonight about bounce. We have been working um, hand in hand with the city um, in regards to housing issues, especially the last two years. And I think we've all can agree that we've made a lot of progress. And what we don't want to see is that progress stifled. Um, so we are looking to make sure that we still have opportunities for development in the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, moving forward, our biotech companies that are expanding their footprints um, need this housing. We are looking at a general plan update. There are a lot of pieces that need to come together for all of this um, to work from an economic standpoint. And um, I don't have a, a, an exact number for you, but I appreciate the 10% mark. Um, I really hope it does not go above that. We need to make sure our developers have um, invested 
um, you know, reasons to invest in our community. And one of the other speakers compared to the city of Ventura, they have a higher density that they allow in their community. We have made it very clear that we do not want a, a strong density in our community. And we have made the general plan and aligned it with those beliefs as a community. And so we can't have both. We can't have all the low income housing and all the low density. And so we need to have a balanced approach with this that is going to benefit both the businesses as well as the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borgia. Next up, we have Rick Schroeder of Manny Mansions. Rick. Mayor McNamee, members of the City Council, City Staff, Rick Schroeder, presidents of Manny Mansions. And tonight really is a historic night with respect to affordable housing. First, the Thousand Oaks Navigation Center, thank you. The Hillcrest for Sale Project, and now this inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, Inclusionary housing is an important component as we go forward in trying to develop more affordable housing. For many reasons, um, many mansions, other nonprofit developers, have a very difficult time developing more affordable housing in the city of Thousand Oaks. To get a, affordable housing financing from the federal government or the state government, Thousand Oaks is not favored. It's low density, high land costs, lack of mass transit very difficult to develop more affordable housing. And therefore, the inclusionary housing ordinance is actually going to play a very large role in developing more affordable units, especially for the low income population. All of many mansions developments now really focus on the very low income. And as an aside, um, there is no disincentive for our residents to earn more income. They're not displaced. They can earn as much money once they had qualified. Their rent may go up, but they do not lose their housing. As to the rental housing, uh, inclusionary housing, we also feel that 10% is too low and that 15% would be a better number. Uh, this number will not discourage developers from developing rental housing. Developers want certainty. And having an ordinance in and of itself will create that certainty. Developers want to build in Thousand Oaks. The demand is high. Rent is high. I don't think developers are going to choose to develop more rental housing in Oxnard instead of Thousand Oaks simply because we have a 15% inclusionary requirement. Also, 15% gives the city a stronger bargaining position with developers. You can start negotiating at 15%. If you start at 10%, you'll never get above that 10%. 15% um, will result over time in a lot more units being developed. 500 units are developed, 10% yields 50 units, where 15% yields 75. That's 25 val more valuable units. The recent projects, the Baxter, the Kmart project, that was much higher than 10%. Uh, my recollection is those numbers were seconds. 12 or 13%. They did not have a problem. Um, I don't see where 15% is a problem, and therefore you should adopt it, see what happens. I think the results uh, will be favorable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trader. City staff, any uh, comments? Uh, yes, if we may, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Parker. So uh, just in terms of some of the comments that we heard this evening, our land use circumstances are unique to Thousand Oaks and they differ greatly from other cities. Uh, specifically, the actions taken in Ventura is reflective of their land use policies, which have densities that are greater than higher than ours, meaning that there's a greater likelihood that they can support a higher percentage in terms of affordable housing. By having lower densities and heights here in Thousand Oaks, that changes our financial analysis and it's factored into the conservative nature of the recommendations that were put forth tonight by our consultant. In terms of legislation surrounding affordable housing on religious facilities, that's something that's still under review and staff is tracking that closely. SB4 is the latest version of that bill 
There have been other bills that address that same issue that have sort of died on the vine in Sacramento that did not move forward. But we are well aware of that, and it's something that we're tracking closely from a staff perspective. And in regard to the linkage fee, uh, the analysis that was considered in terms of what the consultants presented this evening was robust and it is conservative in nature. And it, it's just simply to establish a nexus to determine if a fee can be supported. That does not mean the council has to move forward with that. The decision to apply a fee or not apply a fee is truly a policy decision. And that's direction that staff is looking for from council here this evening. Uh, sure. I just wanted to make a clarification to, I believe it was the first speaker who said what was um, voted on in Ventura last night. I was conveniently their consultant as well. Um, there was a motion to do 10% very low and 5% low for apartments and 15% for ownership. That did not pass. What did pass was 10% low, 5% very low for rental and 15% moderate. I just wanted to provide that clarification. Thank you for the clarification. If there's no other, actually we have um, our favorite city attorney, Tracy Noonan on Zoom. Tracy. Hi, sorry I can't be there with you all tonight, but just really quickly, I just wanted to kind of emphasize the, the basis for the analysis and the basis for what the city council is considering tonight. When, when Kaiser Marston was hired to look at you know, our, a, a potential inclusionary housing ordinance. You know, obviously my number one concern is protecting the city from a legal perspective. And so the number one issue or the most important issue in a financial feasibility study is to ensure that it's legally defensible. And that's why the 10% um, recommendation, it is a conservative recommendation, but um, the Kaiser Marston was charged with looking at our inclusionary housing, uh, a formula that would balance the city's desire to create affordable housing, the desire to create more housing in the community with the desire to maintain a lower level of density and also be able to legally defend um, any type of challenge to it and also ensure that it did not stifle development. We are well aware that if we have a figure that is too high based on the densities in our city, the land valuations, and we don't have an economic basis to ask for it. We already already know that HCD will challenge any percentage that that we cannot legally sustain or that we cannot legally defend. So I just want to remind the council that the 10% figure that is being recommended, it's not an arbitrary figure. It's based on financial feasibility analysis that Kaiser Marston, that Kathy and her team has done. Um, that's it. Thank you, Ms. Noonan. For the sake of discussion among council members, I'm, I'm gonna suggest the following. We've got two items here. One is the linkage fees with industrial, commercial, and so forth. To me, that's the easier one we can deal with, get that off the table. And then we can move into the other and have a more robust discussion. Is council okay with that, that approach? So right now, can we put up the PowerPoint uh, slide that was there regarding what staff recommendation was and what uh, Kaiser Marston recommended so we can have that up in front of us. I don't know who's in charge of PowerPoint. Can we get that up on the screen for us and council and the audience? There we go. So let's, let's start the discussion. We have staff recommended industrial zero to five dollars, KMA recommended zero to five all the way through for all the different council members. I'm open to discussions, Mr. Adam. Come here. That's interesting. It's a complete juxtaposition when the analysis was done back in whatever it was, the turn of the century. Uh, industrial was the only one that didn't work, and all the other ones did. And that just shows you what's happened to office buildings and et cetera. Um, and now, supposedly, the only one that works is industrial. Well, I mean, there's one thing to do a study, and, and but there's other thing to bring in real world concerns. My real world concern about that is industrial is our bioscience. And we have 17 bioscience firms, and we want to have many more than that. We have a huge investment in it. They're bringing all kinds of jobs. They're bringing all kinds of property taxes, uh, you know, all the things the city needs. And um, I, I wouldn't be inclined to 
I, I, I just think it's, a, it's not gonna add that much to anything, frankly, and it's a disincentive and it's a, it's a, it's a bad message to our, our bioscience um, conglomerate out there. That's just my thought. Thank you, sir. Mr. Engler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On, on this particular item, I am, I am a little bit torn. I know that we receive a lot of input from our, um, both from our, from our retail area, from our, from our industrial, from er everywhere else, um, saying that they have trouble recruiting uh, because of the uh, couple of things here in town that we are, are working on getting, one of them being housing. Um, so th there is a benefit to uh, our industrial and, and commercial and retail to have housing that is affordable to employees that may be at their locations. Um, I think uh, in, in uh, Kathy's uh, presentation earlier, there was a, I think there was a mention of a 30% uh, cost to, to rehire or to replace uh, an employee who might leave because there's not an appropriate housing or they're, they're driving in from Palmdale or wherever to come to work here. Um, so there's, there is a benefit to companies uh, to have the affordable housing. Uh, and if there's a benefit, then there should be uh, participation by the, by, the, by the companies. However, I also recognize, as my colleague Mr. Adams recognizes, that we have a burgeoning uh, developments going on out in our industrial area that is creating a hub of activity for um, biotech and other technology that will be uh, the, the future of, of Thousand Oaks um, in the same way that uh, we used to have uh, Northrop out there during the aerospace days. Um, so I, I'm, I'm torn between those two things. My concern is that um, we're not the only fish in the ocean here. Um, that just down the street, um, we have uh, Gurra Hills, we have Westlake Village. Down the hill, we have uh, Camarillo that is in the same general area as our biotech, you know, our burgeoning uh, emerging bi biotech hub um, that could be symbiotic with it, with housing already in place. Um, so I'm not sure whether I'm prepared yet, and I'm still trying to listen to my colleagues and listen to the arguments, because I'm, I'm torn right now between wanting our uh, industrial sector and our, our commercial sector to help us provide the housing that everyone agrees we need but then I don't want to kill the golden goose either. Next up, we have Mr. Taylor, and then we'll go over to Mr. Newman. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. And one thing I'll say, I didn't say it in the beginning, uh, I appreciate you guys going out and doing the study you did. That, that was uh, incredibly detailed, and I know we kind of beat you guys up in some regard, so thank you. Uh, it, this one, it, that was well said, uh, Councilman Engler. Uh, I guess through my lens, and it's primarily through the lens of a business owner, uh, it's hard to do business in California. It, 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 it's actually, I should take a step back. It's hard to do business, period. It's kind of even harder to do it in California in some regards. Uh, that's originally how I was looking at it until you kind of mentioned the dynamics of neighboring cities and you know who is putting a message out there. And you know, Drew and I uh, spoke about this earlier. What cities are putting a message out there to growing industries saying, we want you guys here. We want you to take the risk of bringing a new business online, which ultimately blesses our community because now we're offering new jobs to our residents. And you know, in a lot of regard, we're watching what life science is doing. In, in some regards, this is high paying jobs. This is, this is uh, an opportunity for you to make some good money. Uh, I understand that you know, that might not necessarily directly impact the affordability side of it. But I think the golden goose through my lens is probably something we need to protect and then work on other areas like we have been on the affordability side. So I'm, I'm tempted to lean towards, I want our industry to continue growing and I want 
kind of other industries to know that Thousand Oaks is, is trying to make an effort to grow our local economy. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mind you, all the things we're saying here, there's not gonna be any vote per se, just wanna give input to our consultants as to the direction regarding this particular linkage issue. Guidance, that's a great word, thank you. Mr. Newman. I wanna make a, a plea for balance here. Um, we're, not, we're not talking about just minimum wage people. Um, low income, very low income, these have specific legal definitions in the context of this discussion, okay? We're talking about moderate income housing. We're talking about a family of four making up to $138,000 a year. We're talking about low income. It's not destitution, it's not poverty. It's a family of four making $100,350 a year. There is, there is a contingent that is making minimum wage, and we do need to look after them. But as Mr. Heer noted before, we are, this, this is a multi-level problem we are dealing with here. It is not just one minimum wage group. So I think we need to, to look at, at all of these factors in balance. Now, with regard to um, the fees we're talking about, Council Member Engler mentioned Northrop developing here years ago when there was a lot of defense contracting going on here. And that was a different time. At that time, there was such a thing as a starter home. And it wasn't all rocket scientists. Some of them were, but some of them were janitors. Some of them were carpenters or plumbers or worked, worked other jobs that, that we would put in that low income bucket today, the 100,000 per year bucket today. And it, we have to look after all income levels here, not just the, the biochemists and financial wizards who are doing such great work, but also the, pe the, the rest of the, the workforce who's there. And if we as a, as a council want to have a policy, if we want to put on our signs, you know, Thousand Oaks, go be poor somewhere else, or Thousand Oaks, go away, we've pulled up the ladder, we should say so. We should, we should say that that's, that's what we're doing. But I don't think any of us want to do that. I think, I think that's a bit of hyperbole on my part. I think all of us here, all of us, are making a good faith effort to try to find a way to provide that good housing at all different income levels. And for my part, I would, I would support a 5% linkage fee for the industrial group. I know, I know many people in biosciences here, and many of them would support housing for all different income levels. And I, I join with them in that. Thank you, Mayor. To clarify, it's not 5%, but $5 is what we have up there on the board, zero to $5. Not five dollars per okay, square. Okay, thank you. Just Sorry. want to clarify. Thank you. To come back to the strength of Thousand Oaks is that we have the lowest allowed sales tax in California of seven and a quarter percent. The services we provide here in Thousand Oaks are primarily funded through sales tax. We get one and a quarter percent back if I, my memory is correct. That is an incentive for the consumer to come to Thousand Oaks to spend their hard-earned dollars. They don't go to the city of Westlake or Agora who have just under 10%, they come here. People from the San Fernando Valley I know come here to Thousand Oaks to make purchases in our malls because we have a lower sales tax. We are competitive to the point where we make it attractive for people to come here and spend their hard earned dollars. Let's switch that over to industry. If we start putting linkage fees into our commercial, retail, industrial spaces that we're discussing about right now, we lose our competitive edge. Now we have the biotech hub that we're talking about, high tech we want to bring in, but the more expensive we make it, the less likely they're gonna come and provide jobs, good paying jobs, that also have entry level jobs at minimum wage that the person can grow and actually have a great paying income. I'm not in favor of government picking winners and losers, government being a charity. That's up to the consumer. That's up to the market and the marketplace. 
So when someone is a $15 an hour job, but that owner can't get people to work at $15 an hour, their only option is to offer 20. If they can't get them at 20, they do 25. If they don't get 25, it's up to 30. I've had numerous businesses in my career, and that's the way it works. If you can't find the quality of talent you want, you increase the pay, you increase the benefits, whatever the case may be. So I'm thinking the biotech hub, as I've heard the arguments from my council members, is that, well, you know what, we've got a population out there that's gonna be minimum wage, we need, they may not be able to hire them because they can't come here and live. Well, that can be part of the employee package, that we will provide a certain amount of housing for you, dollars, to be here in Thousand Oaks, or a commuter package to pay for your transit to get here from Camarillo, from Oxnard, from Simi Valley, wherever they're coming in from, to work here. That's up to the market to decide, the owner and the employee. Why are we trying to solve everyone's challenges? The adults out there are smart. They can figure it out. We don't need to do this. So my, my preference is zero, all the way across the board to maintain our competitive advantage, bring businesses in, which in turn, the owners and the employees can figure out the answers that they need if there's housing as an issue. It's not our place to do that as a government. So I'd like to ask uh, any other follow-up comments, questions? Mr. Adam, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, there's a company out in our bioscience hub called Captiva. Some of you may have visited them. They started with three people. They're up to 150. The average age for hires are mid to late 20s. They start them at around $80,000, $90,000 a year. Within three years, they're making up to 150000 This is huge for our community. And charging this, comp this one company, not to mention the other 16, this zero to five dollar fee per square foot is not gonna solve our affordable housing situation, all right? They're, they're bringing a lot to the table already. This is exactly what we need in this community, is high paying jobs for young people. So I, I think that has to be taken. We, can, we could make a lot of progress with affordable housing with in lieu fees, in the next section we're going to talk about, the next section, uh, that, that's where we have the discretion to put those fees into a pot and leverage them to create, you know, untold amount of affordable housing, but to, you know, target this one industry in town, because this is what our industry is, industrial in our town, is bioscience. It's probably 90%, but to target this one industry for the benefits they're bringing just doesn't make sense to me. Let me go around the oh. horn. Mr. Taylor, any other comments? Mr. Engler, go ahead. Mike, the mic was already on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think um, it's been a good discussion, and thank you to my colleagues for the discussion. Um, the point I would, I would like to make, and uh, I'm going to echo a couple of our, our public speakers, um, and, and, and I know we've had this discussion before, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't view this as charity or, or any such thing. Uh, this, is, this is a need in the community. If, if we intend to have a community that is well-balanced and has opportunities for, um, for growth all across the board. Um, one of our speakers um, said, um, as opposed to doing things because the state, you know, quote, quote, makes us do it, um, that, that's not the reason we would do these things. I think it's in our best interest as a city to have that balance and have the uh, opportunities for housing for all levels of income. I just think that's a good outcome for our city. Uh, to have that availability. I know when I moved here, um, part of our decision making was that it was an affordable area. That's no longer true. Um, I probably, if, if it, the, it was the same things, I probably would not be here. So I think having that affordability uh, balance is, is a good idea. Um, so I, I, I just don't share your view that this is charity. This is, this is trying to develop a city that has good foundations and two good feet underneath it. 
What, um, um, what dollar amount would you, because we have $5, it sounds like an auction here. We yeah. have $5 on the floor. What would you uh, suggest? Uh, I, I, um, I, I appreciate my colleague's discussion, and uh, you know, I, I, I would go with, uh, uh, my recommendation would be to go zero across the board because I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the, um, to having the ability to attract that business, but then we can build upon um, for our entire community. Again, this is, it, it hurts us on the one side on the um, inclusionary housing side of the equation, but I think having the balance, and I'm trying to get the balance that my colleague uh, spoke about, if we, if we lose the uh, golden goose, so to speak, then we've lost the balance. So I, I wanna make sure we stay competitive for our industrial and our business base, but then I also wanna make sure we have the affordability side of it. Yeah, so that would be the second part of our discussion, which we haven't gotten to yet. The inclusionary housing is what right. you're referring to. Okay. Right, we'll get to that later, but I'm just you know, I'm giving, you. You, giving you my thoughts on, on where we're going with the, um, uh, the five percent things that you've mentioned. So, non, thank you. Non-residential linkage. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Newman. Go ahead. I have no additional comments okay. at this time. Well, let, let's let's do it this way so we can give them some clear direction. Uh, my thought was if each council member could state their bottom line here as to what dollar amount they would like for the. Uh, uh, Linkage fees. I think, I think they've got the. They know where they've they've got got the back. Yeah. Right, they I, so I we're all zero across checks. the board yep. except for one is yeah. five dollars. Is that the next good? Okay. Uh, that is correct. The notes uh, reflect keep the linkage fee, but set it at zero. Okay. Very good, sir. All right. Now we're going to move on to the fun one. And we have inclusionary housing, which, again, terrific presentation, very overwhelming, much to digest. And we're gonna to try to make sense of this up here and I'm gonna to try to see if I can organize this in a way. If we were to take this apart, I think we could probably start off with the percentages. And Mr. Adam, go ahead, start the discussion. Yeah, there's a lot to say about this, Mayor. I barely know where to start, but uh, just big picture wise, um, you know, com this community for the last 20 years has been virtually no growth, stagnant as much as Ventura County has been. And we finally started to turn the corner. We, we have a change in attitude. We have some political courage from some elected people that have finally decided that maybe it's a good idea to have some housing here in town. And maybe the quality of life is not about not having growth, but about having some growth. That actually makes for quality of life. So just want to be very careful we don't upset this progress that we've made. Big picture. A smaller picture, um, this percentage, this 10% business, I think the consultants made it very clear that as that percentage were to rise, you risk a number of things. You risk a diminishment in quality. Builders, if they're required to build 15% affordable, you pick a number, they're not going to build to the quality that a 299 was built. We're not going to get that, believe me. Uh, furthermore, you all, as the consultant pointed out, the rules that we have as far as density and height don't support 15%. They don't support it. So the only way it could happen is we would have to increase our density ability and increase our height, which is so strange because so many people want affordable housing, but at the same time they don't want density. <laughs> so the, the two are in inexorably linked. If you want affordable housing, you're going to have to have density. So that 10% number to me is, is very reasonable, suffice it to say. Um, and as far as low income, Mr. Newman, you brought that up. I, I think we can address that through these in lieu fees. Uh, and, and, you know, when it comes to for sale property, uh, where it's almost inevitable that they're going to pay the in lieu fee, they're not going to build the one million dollar house and give it away. We build that pot up, then maybe we could we could potentially uh, you know buy uh, start another Hillcrest project with the money in there. And so instead of getting one affordable unit, we get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. We have huge leverage. And so 
and that, there's the point there. What I would want to look at, and we already talk about dropping the, uh, the non-residential fee for industrial, um, maybe, uh, oh, you mentioned the tiered fees for smaller projects. That seems sensible to me. Maybe we could take a look at that. Um, for ownership projects, tier, I think you mentioned for well, they'd, Did you be, tiered, for they'd be tiered for both, but, you okay. could, but as recommended, you could only pay the fee up to 20 units for okay. apartments. Let's explore that a little bit more. Mm, tiered Mr. Fees. Mr. Adam, let me, let me uh, actually ask council members just to give some direction here. That's what I'm doing. We have, we have two, two issues here. One is ownership, one is rental. We're going to look at both. And then, you're correct, but in your discussion, if we can kind of delineate between the two, the other is in lieu fees, which consultant recommended we do that as compared to mandating that you've got nine and a half, therefore you've got to complete it to 10. C comment on that in your discussion as to which you like to go. Is there any other nuances? Yeah, I got a couple more nuances. No, but give me, give me the nuances so everyone can, ch can talk about that. Ian? Mayor, if I may, maybe to help the discussion I did put up on the screen. Um, it, there is the preliminary recommendation. So basically, it summarizes by the various categories. So you can kind so of. So we could probably go you down. Can, you can just go down the list. I mean, it okay. starts with just the basic eligible thresholds. And then you move into the different criteria for the apartment developments, starting with All percentages right. at low income, the in lieu fee, and how it's applied. So let's do this. Mr. Adam, continue well, with your comments. Yeah, let's get and the then let's, let me get the rest of this out. Sure, and then also then you come back to the list we've got and then okay. how you want to go yeah. with it. Thank you, sir. So tiered fees for, uh, oh, hello, for ownership and uh, rental, tiered fees, okay? Um, might want to look at that covenant, the shortening, the duration of that covenant, some options on that. Um, Can we have the... Um, uh, up on the screen here for us, uh, because that is a distance to read for, through so the audience can also see what we're looking at. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I do like the idea of these premium priced um, projects where the in lieu fee is um, by right. I think that makes a lot of sense because that's where we get the leverage. That's where we can take that money, build up a pot of funds, just like we did with Hillcrest and really make a dent in low-income affordability. Um, um, Council Member Taylor had a good point about the economy is ever fluctuating, and we need to be able to respond to that when it comes to this whole issue. So I'd like to see something in that gives us, a, you, you mentioned three to five years we'd look at this, maybe something to give us a little, be a little more nimble as to how we might respond to an economy. Right now, an economy that went from zero interest rates up to six or seven, that's having an impact on building all across the country. So I, I don't exactly know what that'd be. Maybe we'd review it once a year. Maybe we'd review it whenever we wanted. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to stick with that three to five year plan, because I want to be nimble. And um, yeah, just a few thoughts. We're going to go Mr. Taylor, then over to Mr. Newman, go ahead. Okay. Are, are we talking about both together? Are we talking about ownership and just, rental? Just the list. We've, could we put the list back up, please? You're killing me. All right. Go ahead and start, Mr. Taylor. Okay. Um, I, I mean, there's going to be a part of this that's echoing what Councilmember Adams said. But for speaking th just from our experience, if we want to invest somewhere and a deal doesn't pencil, we don't invest. We walk away from it. And so I'm okay, you know, we're trying to put this into our general plan and we need to have, you know, some guidelines. I, I'm gonna echo what, what Council Member Adams said. How do, how do we create flexibility in that? How do we make sure that we're not in a time where we need more housing put online, which in my perspective really helps this conversation, which is affordability. affordability. How do we make sure we're not putting ourselves behind the eight ball where developers aren't developing where we need them to? So. Uh, I like the idea of scale, or, or uh, uh, how would I call it, how would you say it? Yeah, I guess a scale or a, a different level of fees that we might have discretion over uh, implying, and then also more frequent time to do so. Uh, I think that's all, all I'd say about that right now. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Newman. Thank you, Mayor. 
I, I think some history would help here. One, one of my reasons for skepticism around in lieu fees is that we've done such a bad job with them in the past. If you look at the Dos Vientos project, that was conditioned, that was approved, conditioned on the fact that there would be hundreds of affordable units there. And after it was built, at a later time, the developers went to, back to the city and said, we don't want to do it. Here, we'll give you some money. And the city said, okay, we'll, we'll put those units somewhere else. And then at some later time, that allocation just, just got disappeared. So I think the way that we build affordable units is we build affordable units. So if, if I'm skeptical about the power of in lieu fees to get that done, it's because it hasn't gotten it done in the past. I also want to um, agree with a, a public comment that Mr. Schrader made that, that if we start at 10%, that becomes a ceiling and we don't go above that. And we need to look at the recent historical record. We have gone above that recently. So I would prefer that to be higher and, and have it be a floor, not a ceiling. Because as we have done recently, and I agree with you, Al, that we have done some quality projects recently that have included an affordable component, what we've proven is that it is possible to produce affordable housing at here that is good quality, that is what the community is asking for, and that is, that is done at percentages above 10%. So I don't think 10% is, is And all sufficient. of them have asked for the density bonus. Right. I'm not disagreeing that, that so some density. of them have density bonuses, some did not. Uh, the ones I know of did. 299, Kmart, all asked for density Timber school? Bonus. Was Timber, did that have a density bonus? I don't know about Timber school. That Tim was 12%. Timber did not have a density bonus? And it was 12% uh, affordable. Yeah. So it's not necessarily the case that it has to have a density bonus. We, have, we can and we have gone above 10, and I would advocate for a higher number if it's possible, because again, you know, we, can, we can say development industry good, government bad all we want, but the fact is the government here hasn't done anything for a long time, and we've fulfilled, private industry has, only 3% of our needs for low-income housing. So I, I would favor a number higher than 10% there. Um, I agree with, um, staff and uh, recommendation about in lieu fees. I like what you're doing with them. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't have them. I like what you've done to make them hard to apply. I think as a policy matter, we should be build, build first and then only if we can't then, then look at in lieu fees. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Newman. Mr. Engler. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, great discussions, great discussions. Um, uh, I do, I do agree uh, with Mr. Newman that I, I, I wish that our, the 10% was higher. I, I think that we, we have done that in the past in this area. Um, but the bottom line for me is anything higher than 10% defensible. Um, and that's, that's a, a problem in my mind. We can make it 82%, but is it defendable? Yeah, so I, I wanted to uh, um, rely on the consultant that we hired for this, and I know that she and the, and the group did a very um, conservative approach on it, uh, but at 10%, it's defendable. Uh, and that's, that's important, an important factor to me um, and relying on our expert uh, uh, input um, does, uh, helps to guide me on where I need to be. Uh, I could wish all kinds of things, but I think a defensible uh, position is where we need to be. Um, my, imp my input back to our, our consultant is that I would love to see, um, and I, agreeing with my colleague, that um, sticks and mortar is better than, you know, I'll give you a dollar later. Uh, how do we make um, the in lieu fee uh, less attractive than actually putting sticks in the ground. Uh, and, and you have 22 or 2570. 
is that enough of, a, of an amount? If, if that was a little bit higher, would that make it more, in, uh, more of an incentive to actually build? And I wanted you to sharpen your pencil and see if perhaps there's another way to make that a little bit higher so that we can actually get some sticks in the ground. Um, I agree with most of the other things here uh, in, lieu, in lieu payments for projects of, of uh, 20 or fewer. Um, Ms. Mr. Adam talked about a sliding scale, and also uh, Mr. Taylor, a sliding scale for the smaller uh, projects. Um, so I think that's my, my feedback to you, that um, if, if we could incentivize builders to actually build the, uh, the units uh, and not use in lieu fees, that would be my, pr my prerogative. Kelvin says I can ask a clarifying question. Thank you. Um, for both of you, actually. So what you're focused on on the in-lieu fees, do you include that recommendation for both ownership and rental, or are you just talking about the rental? We're just talking about rental right now. But uh, we, we can talk about it a little in a minute or two. Every, everyone's talking about both. Oh, we're talking about both. OK, yes, sir. yeah. Um, yeah, I would, uh, for the, for, the um, for sale, uh, I would flip that coin. I would rather have um, the in lieu fees rather than a um, right. uh, for sale that would only benefit a limited number of people, whereas we can multiply uh, and leverage that money that we get for a larger number of people. That's so I would the flip leverage. the equation. Concur. I as well. Oh, thank I, you, Mr. Taylor. Oh, oh, Mikey, I'm sorry. It, no. If I got this right, apartment complex is 20 units or more, there is no in lieu fee option. Only under extreme economic hardship, for which we have a, a, a detailed definition of what that is. You always have to have this one opportunity, and I'll let the attorneys jump in on this if they want, but you always have to know I have an alternative that if somebody can go prove that you violated the state or federal constitution with your requirement that you haven't then given them an option to avoid no as violating the state or federal constitution, that generally ends up being you can pay an in fee in the case of an extreme economic hardship, which then the council determines whether that's oh. been demonstrated and it's the developer's responsibility to prove it to you. Well, that's probably not likely, is it? Mr. Taylor. <laughs> uh, one thing I'm gonna add is on, uh, no, you're okay. The uh, ownership, uh, I would, lean more, I would lean for the in Luffy on that aspect. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of reiterate some type of flexibility in, in that, just so we can make sure that if we're in a scenario where no one wants to build, we can still push that. If they have deals where we can push it, great. Oh, they absolutely can build. Okay. So they have the right to pay the fee by right, but we can't stop them from building if they want to. No, but the, if the deal doesn't pencil, that stops them. Oh, no, I understood. Them. Right, right, no, right, I understand. Right. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to uh, talk about separate, separating these out. For apartment housing, the 10% I'm very happy with because when it goes up higher than 10%, now the developer does not want to develop and we now create more of a housing shortage. So the 10% I'm, I'm fine with. The in lieu fees for both the apartments and the home ownership, the, are those fixed as to what you have here being 1460 for one and 2570 for the other? Uh, to me, economies change, numbers change. We should be able to have some flat flexibility in there to say up or down from a council standpoint, depending on whether we're in a depression, a recession, or we're in a booming economy, how do we incorporate a possibility of a range? No, thank you for that question. What we'll recommend when we're now preparing our recommendations re report is to have an annual adjustment to the fee, be it up or down, and there's an easy way to do it until you do a big analysis again, which is the Real Estate Research Council every year puts out what the median new home price in Ventura County is. And so we use that to see the percentage change up or down from year to year. It's not perfect, but it does give you a sense of what's happening in the market, whether it's going up or whether it's going down. And so the fee will go up, up or down by that percentage change. So for example, we've been doing this in Huntington Beach since 2007, and it has done that. It's gone up and it's gone down and it's done this. And so it's a good reflection. And, and I agree with the point from, from both of you, because a lot of times cities just never think about it again. It's when you think you're gonna think about it, but then all you're doing everything else. And so this is an automatic 
until you do another analysis. Okay, it's an automatic, because I would like to see it come back to council to say, do we agree with this number or do it annually when that number comes out and say, right. do we like this number or not and work up and down. I mean, you Mr. can absolutely Rudd. do that. The reason I suggest it the way I just explained it is because it's something you can do in 15 minutes and you know it and it does act as a surrogate. Mr. Powers, you're gonna make a comment? Yeah, just as a, as a reminder, the, it, it, we will be setting whatever cycle for review on this from the council standpoint and we'll talk about that as staff you know you do things like annual uh housing element uh review you know mm -hmm. you may set it up on an alignment with that if it's annual you may choose to do it biannually you know you can we can discuss what that looks like but that will be Correct. um this is a way to have a, a fail safe attached to it in the intervening time i'd like to have the flexibility in here can we uh dotv if you can put the uh, screen back up again please thank you sir uh, the Again, I, I appreciate that on both the apartment and home ownership side. I like the option ability on both the apartments and ownership that it's up to the developers to do what's best for the market and make their numbers work. We do not want to tell people not to build in Thousand Oaks, and that's the challenge that we're facing here. I have on the apartment side the affordability covenants at 55 years. That's basically saying it is permanent because these buildings aren't going to last more than 55 years. I would rather have it be something along the lines of 20 years, which is greater than most people for seven after the accelerated depreciation, but yet it still gives 20 years horizon for enjoying this. Is there flexibility in there from 55 to bring it down to say something like a 20 year? And I want to get my other council colleagues' thoughts on that. Oh, this council can answer. I could, I could give you my thoughts on it. I think, I think a longer term is actually better for the the long-term stability of what we're trying to do. 20 years seems like a long time, but I've, I've been here a long time, and it's over 20 years. Are you saying you're old? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think, a, I think a, long, a longer term is actually better for the stability of what we're trying to do. But what, again, remember at 55 years, the building's probably gonna be torn down and built again. But if it's at 20 years, now it reverts to market rate but we also have other units that are gonna be torn down. Now the, that winds up bringing more online to recycle. Do you follow my thought? No, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I, I, the, the, the beauty, you know, st no, and I'm not a market guy, I'd, I would turn to my, my friend, uh, Mr. Taylor down there. Um, I think stability is an important factor in, in whatever we do that, uh, that we give people a long range horizon that's not only just for the people who are going to be renting these apartments, uh, because they may start renting them at 40 years or whatever it is. They have, an, they have a horizon that they know is solid. Um, 20 years does not, in my opinion, give that long enough horizon. Would you do 25? How about 30? <laughs> oh, do we wait, have 35? Wait. Do I hear 40? That's why we have the consultant. Let's let the yeah. consultant come back to us with the different ramifications <clears throat> based on the duration. Okay, I, I, that's what we're asking yeah. for. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'm sorry to step in. I started in the same place um, as you did on this, thinking that, that uh, a shorter covenant term would, would incent more housing production. But I, I rely on our experts here. And when I asked that question earlier tonight, if I understood you correctly, I believe you said it would not. Right. That, that in fact, because businesses of all kinds like stability, 55 years or longer um, would actually be better in terms of in, if, if the goal is to incent housing production. Right, so let's split this between apartments and ownership. So on the apartments, 55 years is by far the most common covenant period imposed by all, not only inclusionary housing programs, but by the low income housing tax credit and by most of the funding sources for affordable housing. It's, it's arbitrary, it, it's, part of, it's part of a statute, which I like. I like things that are part of a statute. I will say the trend in, in, this, in this programmatic situation is it's getting longer rather than shorter. And so this, this whole perpetuity thing has been coming up a lot in my practice recently. And so 55 years is now being viewed as not long enough. Um, Oxnard would be the 20 unit example, and they're in the midst of changing it to 55. 
as we speak. They're meeting in March. Not 20 units, 20 years? 20 years, sorry. Okay, thank you. 20 years, Let's, they're changing. Can we, Council, do uh, another round uh, for everybody to make suggestions? Oh, can I just do the ownership one first? Oh, yes. Yeah. So in the ownership, I'm agnostic because I think you're exactly right. And it's just in who you're trying to help. If you're trying to help individual families, then you're going to want it to be shorter. If you're trying to keep an affordable housing unit in the inventory, you're going to have it be longer. So that one, that's your policy decision. We're going to work my right to left. Mr. Taylor, then Mr. Adam, Mr. Engler, and Mr. Newman. We're going to okay. go around again. I've got two. I think I heard you correctly that you may not have an answer to it. Why is it getting longer and not shorter? Is there no rhyme or reason to it? The, the rhyme or reason to it, again, but it's, it's still kind of random, is that people's 55-year covenants are starting to run out now. Uh -huh. So people have been doing affordable housing now for long enough that the 55-year covenants or the 30-year covenants are coming due, and then you have all these residents who are being displaced, who are living there, who've been living in an affordable unit. All of a sudden, they don't have an affordable unit anymore. So people, it's, it, it's like was just said, it's, you know, 20 years seems like a long time until it isn't. Okay, so then my next question is, are you seeing a situation where you have, you have apartments that have wear and tear on them, right? These things, that's why we get to depreciate them. Are you, are you seeing a point where you're almost seeing like a slumlord style breakout where there's no incentive to actually start renovating the low income units because you can't drive margin up? So you basically put all your renovation dollars towards the units that you can drive to market and you let the low income just basically be a bad place to live. Absolutely not. You don't? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely not. Why do you not because see that? Because cities are really vigilant on this. That's why. Because you, you, the, there's a very strong requirement in, in cities like this right. for doing inclusionary housing that they want the quality of those projects to be maintained. And so you'll have a regulatory agreement that requires maintenance standards. Okay. And so I, I, in all the things I've seen, and don't even get me started on home ownership because of all the things I've seen. Right. But... No, I've never seen absolutely it. not seen a diminishment in quality. Okay, good. And if I can add, Council Member Taylor, um, you know, the city embarks on CDBG funds and other funds that actually help with the rehab of these designated units. So that there's an ongoing commitment from the city through the grants that we receive federally to maintain these. So that situation where, you know, the wear and tear of these units um, is, you know, Basically, we are helping subsidize some of that through the grant funds that we receive. In terms of the time frame, you know, limiting, uh, reducing it down to less than 55 years. I mean, right now, yeah, we're seeing a lot of units being lost because they're in, at the end of their covenant periods. So, if you reduce that frequency down to 20 years, then annually, as we approach those 20 years, we're going to be reporting more and more of those units lost. And I think it will just ultimately. We're reporting that to HCD, who is basically the watchdog on the production of affordable housing and how it is maintained within the community. Next one, Mr. Taylor, are you good? Uh, I'm good, and thank you for Mr. That. Adam, real quick, so we can uh, do, go around the horn and um, start wrapping this up. Any other comments, any other thoughts? Uh, no, I think we've provided some adequate guidance, and I look forward to you coming back with us, to us, and uh, answering some of these questions that we brought up. and. I think we're good. Thank you, sir. Move on to Mr. Engler, anything? No, I just thank uh, Kathy for backing me up on 40 years is not that long, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've been at Kaiser Marston 40 years in June, so it's... Mr. Newman. Although I am old also. I, I want to add my thanks as well. And, and I, I, I think I'm with you on the, on the housing side, that, that some flexibility, whatever... Um, gets more equity in our community, I would be in favor of. Um, if it's 45, that's okay. If it's shorter than that, I'd also be okay. Thank you. Mr. Parker, any uh, clarifications you need? Are you clear on direction? Are, uh, we, are we, we all good? Uh, um, Ian's gonna bring up one more item that we need to address. Yes, so um, I've brought up the second part of the slide, which deals with other kind of options. Um, you just disregard the last line item there, because that was left there for the linkage fee, which you've discussed. But there's two other things we would want to just kind of get your feedback on, is the offsite production of inclusionary housing. Um, the pre what's being presented is no offsite production whatsoever for apartment projects, and then the option to do that as part of ownership projects, whether there's a parcel within the project set aside for affordable apartments, 
or a completely off-site parcel set aside. Okay. On for is this the last choices that we have here to give you direction? Excellent, Mr. Um, and there's oh. two others, but um, I'll just focus on the one that KMA would recommend based on city council's discretion, and that would be any kind of land dedication towards the production of affordable housing. That's another slide that we don't see yet, is that correct? That's on this slide right here. Oh, very good, that's what we're looking at. Yes. Mr. Taylor, you have the first shot at this. Uh, no offsite production apartments just because it doesn't financially make sense to do so, I imagine. Okay. Uh, and then ownership, you have options there. So I'm, I'm good with this. Mr. Adam. Yeah, I, I think this is what we had indicated in the first go round. So it looks okay to me. Very good, sir. Yeah, it was the same thing. I think we had the same input last time around. That's why we're seeing it now. Um, I, no, I have no comment really on these. Mr. Newman. Thank you, I'm fine with all of these as well. I am as well, very good, so let's move on. Uh, Mr. Holt, anything else here that we need to uh, talk about or address? Mr. Uh, no, I know that uh, Mr. Heer is gonna say, we, we, oh. the one thing we will need a motion on tonight is the sequel portion of uh, <laughs> Just a quick motion, the third recommendation uh, was uh, that this is not a project under CEQA, so if you could just make that quick motion, I would appreciate it. Anyone make that motion? What I'd be happy, motion? I'd be happy to make that. This is not a CEQA project? I'd be happy to make this as not a sequel. Oh, Bob, please. S this is not Madam a Clerk, sequel. please call the roll. Councilmember Angler? Yes. Councilmember Newman? Yes. Councilmember Taylor? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam? Yes. And Mayor McNamee? Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next item. Again, staff, thank you so much. Consultants, thank you so much for the work you've put into this. Thank you so much. Next up, we have our very own one and only, Mr. David Newman, who went to the Cal Cities Conference for New Mayors and Council Members Academy. He's gonna present a report here. Mr. Newman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, very quickly, I have three items here. Um, I did uh, attend the Cal Cities uh, New Council Members Academy with our Legislative um, Affairs Director, Mina Leba, early this month. It was excellent. It provided uh, training on a wide variety of issues of interest to all of us on the council. There were mandatory training we all have to take on harassment prevention and ethics, um, a workshop on working effectively with staff, which I hope to make use of, um, land use policy, something we hashed out pretty well tonight, uh, social media engagement and what the legal environment is around that, other legal challenges we faced, um, even more ABs and SBs than we hear from legal on a typical night. Um, and then a very useful um, presentation for me on, on our financial responsibilities and city revenues and how to read a budget. So all in all, time very, very well spent. I wanna thank Ms. Leba for her very comprehensive report on three very educational days. If I may, just quickly, I wanna add two more items. I want to commend in the strongest way I can our city's public works department, who in horrendous weather conditions, over overnight Friday night, uh, multiple crews were out keeping this, the streets safe and clean despite high winds, despite rain and sleet that was going sideways, despite very dangerous conditions. These are the people you want out there keeping us all safe, and I'm very grateful for that. And then finally, I want to um, commend all nearly 500 city residents, community leaders who took part in the March Against Hate um, last event, the Walk Against Hate event. Uh, last Sunday, it was very well attended. Um, there, in addition to nearly 500 residents, there were numerous community le leaders. Assembly member Jackie Irwin was there. Uh, Sheriff Jim Fryhoff was there. DA Eric Nazarenko. Chief Paris was there. Um, many other community leaders. Multiple council members from other cities were there. And all of us together said, made clear that there's no place for hate in this community, and that was very encouraging to hear, and I hope there will be future events. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Excellent. Now, I need to have a motion here for 19A, 
one and two recommendation, please? Anyone want to make that motion? You have to say something. You can't wave at me. Yeah, I'll motion. Excellent. I'll motion. Move that forward. So Mikey is uh, Taylor is yes, secret. Rec, uh, making a motion for 19A to receive the report and uh, and to not, find it secret project. exempt. Yes, I'm getting to that. Um, receive the report and the action is not a project defined under CEQA. City Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Engler. Yes. Councilmember Newman. Yes. Councilmember Taylor. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Adam. Yes. And Mayor McNamee. Yes. And that motion passes five to zero. Let's move on to city manager. Please, any announcements and upcoming Thanks. issues? Uh, um, Mayor McNamee, we have a meeting two weeks from tonight on the 14th of uh, March. Um, we currently have a series of items uh, set for that evening. Um, uh, one of the regular reviews of uh, council protocols. Um, we have our campaign contribution review, which we do in off years, uh, as long as well as a, um, a department report on sign code, uh, which we had promised to bring forward. Uh, we'll also be having our general plan annual progress report and a study session on user fees. Um, uh, so that will be on the 14th, and I look forward to seeing everyone then. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Powers. With that, I'm going to adjourn to our regularly scheduled meeting. March 14, 2023.